The goal of the 19th is really to change the conversation around how we talk about women and LGBTQ people in politics. We are firm believers that all issues are women's issues. Our readers are people who want to be better informed and better able to participate in democracy. We're aiming to change the future of American journalism by giving women and the LGBTQ community the platform and the voice that they deserve. There's never been a better moment than right now. The 19th is the newsroom that we've been waiting for. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Live with the 19th. I'm Emily Ramshaw, co-founder and CEO of the 19th, an independent nonprofit newsroom that aims to empower you with the information, resources, and community you need to be equal participants in our democracy. Today, the 19th is bringing together doctors, medical experts, elected officials, patients, and more for an afternoon of critical conversations on the role gender plays in health outcomes. Historically, medical training has taken a narrow view of the human body, focusing research and education on the bodies of healthy white men. That's created a knowledge gap that has disadvantaged anyone outside of that quote unquote norm. Can science paired with new medical training and understanding improve health outcomes for those who have been underserved or even harmed by this legacy in medicine? Before we get started, we'd like to thank our founding sponsor, the Commonwealth Fund for making this event possible. Here to share a few words is Lori Zephyrin, Vice President of Advancing Health Equity at the Commonwealth Fund. Thank you so much, Emily. I am so thrilled that the 19th has gathered this fantastic group of speakers and journalists to delve more deeply into gender and health outcomes, especially given the critical time that we're in to discuss these topics in an equity-centered way. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed and in many ways further exacerbated social inequities as well as gaps within the healthcare system. And that, as we know, has trickled down leading to both directly and indirectly affecting gender and health and economic standing. As an OBGYN myself, who has worked in health systems and on key policy issues and now leading work at the Commonwealth Fund, analyzing the impact of health inequities and asking the vital questions, in, ways, in what ways does our healthcare system contribute to these inequities? How can we break down the systems, policies, and practices that have gotten us to these unequal outcomes? And most importantly, how do we create new inclusive structures that advance equity? It's really important that we address head on the inequities that exist in health and healthcare, including the impact of intersectionality, for example, the intersections of race and gender. And as we have, we also have to break out of our silos, in addition to reproductive healthcare needs such as contraception and fertility and maternity services, there are gender differences in how people are more likely to experience certain diseases, such as lung cancer and are at higher risk for others, for example, cardiovascular diseases. Moreover, we can definitely do better. Health status indicators show that women in the US have worse outcomes than women in other high income countries. For example, the rate of maternal mortality is higher in the United States than in any other high income country. And this continues to be on the rise. This is a striking indicator of how much our healthcare system needs to improve. There are major gaps and barriers, and I can list them, including gaps in medical training, uh, gaps in racial and gender inclusivity, barriers to utilization and delivery of care, including biases and time constraints and lack of focus on social drivers of health and lack of focus on systemic racism, um, access barriers relating to language and lack of a regular source of primary care, underrepresentation of women in healthcare leadership and policymaking, and the increasing politicization of women's and gender health issues. For far too long, we've put the onus of poor health on individuals and communities when we should have been doing the exact opposite. We have an opportunity to impact our systems and policies to drive change. We need to be sure that our health system, payment models, and innovations are built for equity from the ground up from the moment of your first encounter throughout your entire life. So once again, really thank you to the 19th for hosting this important conversation. The Commonwealth Fund is thrilled to support it and I hope you all enjoy it and that it spurs action and change.
A quick reminder that while sponsors help keep the 19th events free to attend, they play no part in the programming of these conversations. As our conversation kicks off, we hope you'll share what resonates with you on social media using the hashtag the 19th represents. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our free newsletter, you can do that now at 19thnews.org slash subscribe, where you can find out about upcoming 19th events, read our incredible journalism, and more. Now, let's get started with an important conversation on representation in medicine and the impact it can have on your healthcare. Should your doctor look like you? Here to consider that question are Dr. Oni Blackstock, a New York City-based primary care and HIV physician and the executive director of Health Justice, where she trains health-related organizations to reduce health inequities in the communities they serve. And Dr. Laura Huang, an associate professor of business administration at Harvard Business School and the author of the book, Edge, Turning Adversity into Advantage. Shafali Luthra, health reporter for the 19th, will lead this conversation. Shafali? Thank you for that introduction, Emily. I am so excited to be here for this really important panel. And I know that we, we're really focusing right on the question of what does it mean to have your doctor look like you? And I wanted to start just thinking kind of big picture, hearing from both of you, the shared experience that we're talking about, right, in terms of race, of gender identity, of sexual orientation, of all these other factors, why does it matter? And maybe from a research and practice standpoint, what does that sort of shared experience bring to the medical setting? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, so when, when you sort of speak about diversity and care and um, what your care providers should, should sort of look like, um, you know, what, what we studied, what, what my co-authors and I have studied is this, this aspect of congruence and concordance. So we've studied it from two different points of view. We've looked at gender concordance. So do you share the same gender with your provider, your medical provider, and also from racial concordance? And what we found was in the first study, uh, we looked at patient disparities in survival rates following acute myocardial infarction, so basically heart attacks. And we saw, we looked at the rate of heart attacks of men versus women based on their treating physician. And what we found was that um, male, and, male and female patients um, experience similar outcomes when treated by female physicians, um, but there's sort of unique challenges when male physicians are treating female patients. So um, female patients who are treated by male physicians are more likely, have a higher mortality. So that's sort of one, one sort of bucket of the research that is pretty sort of severe and we thought pretty noteworthy. Um, in terms of racial concordance, what we looked at instead was not heart attacks because we wanted to move to a different context. And we looked at um, OBGYNs um, and black newborns. So white newborn babies, black newborn babies. And what we found was that well, in, in general, um, the rate of black newborns, so black newborns are dying at three times the rate of white newborns. Now that's serious in of itself, um, but what we find is that when the black newborns are treated by a black provider, that rate of mortality actually goes down. Um, and so, you know, I'll sort of start there and pass it back to you, but I just wanted to sort of outline some of our research findings um, to set some of the stage. And Dr. Blackstock, how does that fit in with your experience? Sure. So um, I'm a primary care and HIV physician and, you know, have been both a provider as well as a patient. And I always think about uh, the reaction that a number of my patients have when they're meeting me for the first time. Um, I, I work in, at a HIV clinic in Harlem Hospital. And so my patient population is um, predominantly um, Black American. Um, and patients are almost always like, oh my goodness, you're my doctor. I can't believe it. And I can kind of see this big ex exhale that they often take um, seeing a provider who who looks like them, who may be from a, a similar um, background. And I think this is really important because you know, as a patient, being a patient is being in a very vulnerable position. Um, you know, I, I like to think of my patients as they're also experts in like their own lived experience, but the reality is there is an asymmetry um, or differential in, in sort of power. And so I think for many patients, um, if there is an aspect of identity 
that is shared that can bring um, a great deal of, of comfort and can allay, can allay fear. So, um, and just to say, I, I previously um, had a career in research and also looked at sort of concordance, um, gender concordance in terms of HIV care as well. And just to say that it looks like there are a lot of sort of like mixed and inconsistent results, but there definitely does seem to be a trend, for instance, when we're looking at um, racial, racial concordance um, of um, poor quality of communication, sort of lower satisfaction. We look at the experiences, for instance, of black patients um, with white providers versus black providers. And this is all really important when we're looking at racial and gender inequities and really trying to figure out what is contributing to these. And we know that the patient provider interaction does play a really important role um, and does contribute in some ways to the inequities that we do see in health outcomes. Given what we've seen, right, what what we see in the field, what we see in the research about, right, the importance of shared racial gender identities, how difficult is it for a patient to get medical care from someone who has those sorts of similar background factors? And are there roles that, that maybe other providers, right, nurses, et cetera, can also play to help address some of these gaps? Yeah, no, I think that's a really um, important question because, you know, I think there are a number of different potential solutions to what we're seeing in terms of biases showing up in the patient provider um, interaction. And, um, you know, some people talk about, well, we need to obviously have, you know, greater representation of um, certain groups among providers. So for instance, about 5% of physicians um, in this country are Black, about another 5 to 6% are Latino. And we know that that is a substantial underrepresentation compared to representation of Black and Latino folks um, in the general population. So obviously initiatives that really focus on, um, you know, increasing um, the numbers of underrepresented minoritized populations in medicine is really important, but that's not going to be sufficient, right? We actually need all providers to be able to provide um, what we call culturally competent care, as well as structurally competent care, really understanding what are some of the, the structural drivers of, um, of racial inequities, of gender inequities. So really, I think that really calls for definitely more training um, of, of medical providers. But I think also to your point, um, Shafali, that we also need to also bring in, um, you know, other members of the medical team as well. I know that, you know, many patients often can identify with like the nursing staff. Often among the nursing staff, there is, for instance, um, sort of greater representation of black and Latino um, individuals. And so I know for many patients will often like share something with the nurse that they may be scared to tell um, their physician. So I think having, um, you know, diversity, obviously, across the, the medical team and using a team-based approach is really important for thinking about sort of mitigating um, these biases. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, there's sort of two pieces to this. I think um, the first piece is, um, you know, you don't always get a choice in who your physician is. Um, and so, um, what our research shows is that it's not to say that you should be trying to specifically pick certain physicians or certain providers, um, because you know it's it's we're we're not saying that there are certain physicians that are better than the other or that you will always have that choice. So so it's something to keep in mind. But what it also suggests is that um, there is the role of training. There is the role of exposure. Um, in our research, we find that male physicians, for example, with exposure to more female patients are more likely to see this effect attenuated. Um, we see that um, male, male patients who have more um, female colleagues um, are also uh, more likely or more likely to see this, this effect attenuate. So there are certain factors um, in terms of exposure, in terms of training that, that do mitigate what we are seeing. I think that's a really interesting point, right? Because one of the things we're talking about is, right, the, the relative lack of diversity in, in the medical profession, and that takes time to address, right? But maybe trainings could, could address some of the, the systemic problems faster than, right? Yeah, no, I think um, trainings, obviously, starting, you know, in, in medical school and continuing on throughout um, physicians' careers are incredibly important. And also, I just want to make sure I'm not limiting to this discussion, just physicians, like, obviously, they're nurse practitioners, physicians' assistants, you know, um, nurses, obviously, who are all um, providing care and, and part of the, um, the, the care team. So, 
yeah, so that's all, um, you know, I think in, um, incredibly, the trainings are important, but I think also there needs to be, um, you know, I don't know if they're like standardized protocols, decision-making tools that can also ensure that providers are sort of checking their biases and ensuring that they are doing, um, providing similar care um, to patients, obviously recognizing that different patients have different needs, but if there are sort of like basic things that providers need to be doing with their patients, that, that all patients are aware of what those things are. And um, I think often providers are driven by, you know, unfortunately, it's a, we have a profit-based um, healthcare system. So things such as like re reimbursements, um, getting incentives, you know, I think may help to um, ensure that providers are, are working toward provide, providing equitable care to their patients. So I think things of that nature might be um, helpful. So having protocols, having incentives, making reimbursement um, contingent on providing equitable care, I think could all be potential um, solutions um, to this issue. I, I think that there there are solutions, um, and 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 we're we're sort of starting to see those solutions come about. Uh, but it but it's not it's not a straightforward thing, and a lot of these things are very implicit. Yeah, and just to add, like, so yeah, I was going to just mention. So there's you know I think over the last few years, much more attention given to this idea of like implicit bias training or um, bias mitigation, and. I think the abundance of data that we have is that they, it doesn't always translate into changes in actual um, behavior. Um, and so we really need to think about, um, you know, what are, what are approaches or strategies that can actually modify behavior. And I think trainings are great, but those are often one time sort of things. And so having sort of continuous feedback on, I think, provider behavior um, can be um, really important and critical to this. And I think the point, right, about socialization is just so interesting, right? The idea that those effects were maybe ameliorated somewhat in settings where, right, male physicians just spent more time with female patients or female physicians. I wanted to talk a little bit about specific kinds of, of both care and sort of health conditions that we treat and think about how provider diversity plays a role there as well. Are there specific benefits around certain kinds of health care where we really see more value in having a, a provider who, right, who looks like you. I'm wondering about mental health care, reproductive health care, other sorts of avenues. I mean, I think the main point about congruence and con, you know, in, in terms of concordance and having someone who looks like you, um, it's not so much that you have someone who looks like you, it's more that you have someone who understands the experiences, your unique experiences. And so it's about asking the right questions, it's about experiencing, um, it, it's about sort of having that, you know, for example, with heart attacks, um, men and women present differently, that the symptoms, the, the ways in which you um, realize that a heart attack is coming about, there's, there, there's differences. So, you know, I'll give another example where we see in the medical field that, for example, um, a lot of the surgical tools um, were designed for male hands. And so women surgeons have had to adapt in terms of the way that they grip the tools or in the way that they use the tools um, because they were designed for male hands. And if medical school, if in medical school, a lot of the, the, the training is around the symptoms that men would present under or men would be, you know, for heart attacks or, or any sorts of um any sort of conditions, that's going to be another that's going to be another concern. And so it's not so much that you would want to try to actually match who it is your provider is with what you exactly look like. You just want to make sure that that person is going to be able to ask the questions, get the underlying sort of information that they need, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and I would just yeah add to what what Laura was saying that. Um, there's data showing that women physicians tend to engage in sort of more active like partnership with their patients, tend to do more counseling, tend to um, recommend more preventive uh, medicine um, measures than male physicians. And the reality is like, you know, all physicians or medical providers really should be practicing patient-centered care, shared decision-making. Um, and so I think, you know, we had mentioned probably the socialization aspect um, I think that we, we kind of see that emerge in terms of how women are expected to behave sort of outside, outside of the healthcare setting. And then that comes into play um, within healthcare settings. But the reality is we want, you know, all medical providers to have um, this skill set. 
one thing we hear so much about, right, is thinking about, you mentioned heart attacks, stories about how physicians might sort of dismiss or underconsider reports of pain, right? Especially when reported by women and especially by black women. And I wanted to ask sort of what the implications are of this kind of phenomenon, how, how sort of this provider relationship could, could be leveraged to address it. And what do you think are the other medical issues that are perhaps exacerbated by like the relative, to, to be somewhat reductive, right? White male centricity of the medical field. Mm -hmm. Maybe Dr. Blacksock, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, actually, as you're asking the question about um, pain, I actually thought about my now nine-year-old when he was four years old, broke his wrist, and we took him to the emergency department, and um, the orthopedist who was resetting it and putting the cast on did not give him any pain medication and did whatever he did really fast. And I've never seen my child in more pain. And it just made me, you know, just think, you know, reflect on the literature, which shows that, you know, even among children, um, black children are, are less likely to get pain medications so for the same sort of fractures or injuries as white children. So this is not just something that we see among adults. We also see it among um, children as well. And so, you know, obviously assessments of pain, I think in particular pain, because it's something that is, um, you know, considered subjective. Um, I think often providers can say, oh, well, you know, I, I actually don't think that you're in, in this much pain, um, which can be obviously very frustrating and dehumanizing um, for patients. But this can have like, you know, really horrible outcomes, not just in terms of sort of physical complications, but also just mental, psychologically, emotionally um, for, for many patients. Um, so yeah, pain is one, I think that has been like very much studied and what they have found actually is that people, even nowadays, medical students and residents who are doctors in training, um, you know, hold beliefs about sort of biological differences in the perception of pain. So there's a study that people often will quote, um, I believe by Hoffman et al, who, um, found that, e that even, um, trainees felt that like black people had thicker skin. Than white people and that was a reason why they may not feel pain to a, the same level that a white person has so this is like tremendous um traumatic effects um, on individuals um and we see this obviously across many different other conditions but i think in particular those conditions where there's a vague sort of vague symptom that cannot necessarily always be assessed you know via radiology or imaging um, I think that those that often is fertile ground for these sort of beliefs to emerge. But even when we know there are objective signs like fracture, things of this nature, there's still differential um, treatment in terms of receiving recommended care or not. Professor Huang, is there anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right, right? And a lot of um, what, what I study is the perceptions of, of someone that you're interacting with, as well as the underlying perceptions. And in terms of you know, the perceptions that we have of certain patients, it's everything from who experiences higher pain thresholds, who's going to adhere to certain medication um, better, right? So there's, there's judgments that are made about um, in terms of, for example, weight loss, who's going to actually be able to follow a weight loss regimen versus who's going to need to receive um, drugs and, and medicine to, to lose that weight. Um, things like um, the ways that physicians interact with their patients, right? So from some patients, they actually will get close to them and actually touch and, and, and experience sort of touch and, and other patients are going to be much more hands off. And these are, these are differences that we observe in terms of these interactions that physicians have with their patients, which can all determine and all lead to different outcomes. I wanted to ask specifically as well about reproductive health care and the experience of trans and non-binary patients in particular? And how do we think about the importance of, of gender diversity and in particular, like the relative lack, right, of trans and non-binary providers in terms of what kind of care is available? Yeah, so this is like a, a major, a major issue. Um, so, you know, in addition to what you're saying in terms of the, the paucity of trans and non-binary providers is that many people who are practicing or don't have training in providing um, care to people who are trans and non-binary, which is obviously not acceptable. Um, so we do need, you know, healthcare um, systems and organizations really need to do um, a much better job in terms of continuing medical education 
for providers to ensure that they are able to provide care to people who are trans, to people who are non-binary, um, but that also um, not just the providers, the front desk staff, that everybody is, you know, is up to date um, on what they should be doing. Um, we know that particularly people who are trans um, often will forego care um, because of anticipated um, stigma or, or discrimination. Um, and so that can also obviously lead to, to worsened um, health outcomes. So, this is a yeah. It's a major. Um, it's a major gap in, in the care that is being provided, and, and definitely um, contributes to a number of, of inequities that we see. And this is obviously worsened when folks are um, black or Latino or Asian um, and trans um, or non-binary. So um, you know, I think there are some efforts. There are some um, fellowship programs that I've seen that are specializing in training providers in trans care and the care of non-binary. Um, individuals, but um, I think substantially more needs to be done. Professor Huang, did you want to add anything or? Uh, you, I think it's very much about this experience that 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 um, that we've sort of been mentioning already. It's the overall experience, you know. Dr. Blackstock mentioned that it's everything from the front office staff to um, the nurses, the support staff, to the physician. Um, and we see, we also see that the experiences will differ. Even if you have a phenomenal physician or end care provider, if your experience leading up to that was either um, you know, rushed or you, you felt like your questions weren't getting answered. And, and I think this happens a lot based on, um, again, these perceptions of race, gender, um, ethnicity, sexual orientation, class, um, a variety of different factors that are out there, including, um, including, you know, some of the ones that you've already mentioned. And just to add to what Professor Huang was saying, um, we do know that because of often the fast pace of, of medicine, of medical care, because providers, for instance, in primary care clinics have to see patients like every 15 minutes, that when people don't have a lot of time to process, they often go off of um, stereotype beliefs, and it tends to be more sort of working from muscle memory, um, as opposed to really like stopping, pausing, and like really processing what they're hearing from their patient and what their assessment um, of the situation is. So it, it, there are many factors, I think, also that contribute to um, um, these biases and discrimination and prejudices um, showing up in um, the healthcare setting. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that the, the, that's that's a point that I you know also want to echo is that um, you know in in all of the studies that that we've sort of conducted, we we do have to control for a variety of different things, right? So we're we're controlling for comorbidities, we're controlling for um, you know how how busy the hospital is, which hospital it's in. We we look at zip code, patient zip code, right? Because we're looking at demographics. Um, and we're looking at all of these different factors, but we do find that, for example, in terms of gender or racial concordance for black babies, we do see that the benefits manifest more in challenging births um, and in hospitals that deliver more black babies, right? So there's all of these nuances that, that need to be considered when, when you look at these, these, these factors. One element I wanna talk a little bit about is thinking thinking sort of about why we are in the situation that we're in, right? And, and Dr. Blackstock, you mentioned early on what the data shows about diversity or, or lack thereof, right, in, in the medical profession. And, right, the most recent data suggests that medical residents, right, they mirror what we see in doctors right now. About 50% are white, Black, Black and Latinx people are underrepresented. And why is it that even as we have become more aware of these, these shortcomings, the medical system still looks the way it does. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think it's multifactorial, but we do know that getting like the path to getting even to medical school requires substantial resources and investment. So if we think about, um, you know, young people who may be coming from communities where their schools are um, under-resourced and they're not getting the quality of education that, that all children deserve, um, those are issues. It's also about, you know, seeing re the representation. So seeing people like yourself who were who are doing that that profession. So my um, I have a twin sister who's a physician, but we our mother was a physician, and it was it's funny. Um, my little one actually said to me, he said to me when he was like four or five, he said, "Mommy, I'm really sad. I'm not going to be able to be a doctor." And I said, "Well, what? Why is that, sweetie?" He's like, "Because you can only be a woman, and it's because." 
all of the all the doctors he knew were like women and they're also like black women which is just funny but it made me realize how like you can't be what what is it you can't be what you can't see um so i think also just having exposure um to people in the profession obviously is incredibly important in order for that to be something that maybe young people want to aspire to um but we're just thinking about all along the way from k through 12 to college you know what are the supports that um that people from you know who are black or latino are getting that um, can allow them really to get to medical school and then applying for, for um, you know, just the cost of applying to medical school is quite expensive. So there are just a lot of um, areas um, where we do need to, um, you know, patch up that leaky pipeline so that we can get folks in a good position to get to medical school. But I should also say once people are in medical school, they also need to be supported. Um, we know that with medical school, um, the application processes that look at the applicant in a holistic way, that those schools that do that um, tend to actually have more diverse representation in their medical school body, as opposed to just looking at a standardized tests or GPA. And they don't actually sacrifice quality, like the students are do incredibly well, and they go on to great residency programs. So there are many different areas where we can make adjustments in order to um, make medicine um, more representative of, of the general population. Professor Huang, did you want to add anything or? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think Dr. Blackstock captured it um, pretty well there. I think we we do need to have all of those things in place. Um, I think, you know, I, I also, I also know a good family friend of ours, um, you know, he became a, he became a doctor because when he was little, he had this experience where his uncle was really sick and the physician took such great care of his uncle that he was so grateful and he really remembered that there was there was this big, this emotional experience. And so there was something around how those that physician treated his uncle and treated his family. And even though that physician didn't look like him, um, he remembered that. So it again, it goes back to this, it goes back to the point about yes, you can, it can be around someone who looks like you and someone you can put yourself in their shoes and embody that person. But it's also about the emotions and how it makes you feel and 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 being in that sort of mind frame where even if somebody doesn't look like you, that you can still envision yourself, right? Even though you might not um, be able to, even though it, you know, it's it's like the even though this house might not be what you lived in before, you can still see yourself in that or the car that you're driving or the, the friends that you have or whatever it is. It's, it's being able to really do that perspective taking and that comes with the emotions and the experience. I am also curious about structural sorts of shortcomings or, or benefits that might exist in within like a hospital, for instance, right? And the employment structures that exist for healthcare professionals, do we need to be talking about things like pay equity and family leave and those sorts of, of retention factors, right? That can really shape whether people stay in a profession. I mean, I can, I can start there. I mean, there, there's a large body of research that shows that um, people care more about procedural justice than the actual outcome. So meaning, when you feel like you've been treated fairly, even if the outcome was not what you intended or was not a fair, what's considered a fair outcome, because you feel like the process was the right one and because there procedurally was some understanding of what happened, you are more okay with the outcome than otherwise. And so what that suggests is that even within um, a hospital setting or any sort of organizational setting that we, we do need to be able to have feel like things are are somewhat equitable that the pay structures are there that they're transparent. Now that being said, um, in 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 my recent book right what I find and some of the research that went into that that book what I find is that even when so there are lots of initiatives trying to create more equity and more equality. So for example, trying to get more women and people of color in top management team positions or top positions in hospitals and, and healthcare settings, or trying to be more equitable and more um, fact-based in our hiring, right? So having checklists to help us do hiring or algorithms even to, to make sure that our hiring is more fair. Now, all of these things are steps in the right direction. 
And I would never say that they're not steps in the right direction because these are things that we should be doing. But at the same time, it leaves individuals within these systems sometimes feeling like, um, feeling feeling worse off because it's as if we're telling a lot of individuals and telling people just wait right we know that we've got an imperfect system but just wait until we try and fix it or wait as we as we try and put these things in place and and so in my book um i talk about how it's it's not just about putting these systems in place and and implementing from them from the outside in we also need to be empowering people from the inside out so that they have ways to navigate and tactics that they can employ and ways that they can still try and gain this, this advantage when, when they feel like they're at a disadvantage. Yeah, and just to, to add, um, you were mentioning um, to Polly about like just structure, maybe how healthcare system is structured that might um, also contribute to these um, disparities. I just think about my time in academia as an academic research um, you know, for instance, like having, I don't think I had like maternity leave. I think I could, I, um, or it was like, I had it, but it was sort of limited. I think I used, I'd use my vacation time. That's what I did and use vacation time for maternity leave as opposed to having like paid parental leave um, being offered. Um, um, and also the salaries, for instance, in academia are, are much lower. And so for many people who may be first generation in their family, people who aren't coming from substantial resources, like that's going to dissuade folks from going into academic medicine because they are the only one in their family, you know, who's gone to college, who's gone to graduate school, and they have many people who are dependent on them. So they may either, um, you know, go into, um, you know, work at a community hospital, or they may maybe go into, um, to uh, what do you call it, industry. But, but just to say that there are a number of, of ways in which medicine or healthcare is structured that can um, really be barriers to folks who, you know, aren't coming with, with much resources. I think we are running out of time, but this has been so wonderful. I have learned so much from talking to both of you and I suspect our audience has too. Thank you both so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Blackstock, Professor Huang, and Shafali. Next, we're going to take a close look at several healthcare challenges that affect up to 70% of women in this country and disproportionately affect Black women. Despite the fact that they can cause incredible pain and lead to infertility and other complications, fibroids and endometriosis are understudied and treatments are underfunded. For this discussion, we have with us Dr. Erica Marsh, the Chief of the Division of Reproductive Endocrinology and Infertility at the University of Michigan Medical School, and Congresswoman Nakima Williams, a Democrat representing Georgia's 5th District. Late last year, she launched the Congressional Endometriosis Caucus to bring attention to this condition that she has suffered from. Moderating this conversation is Dr. Jennifer Okwareku, a reproductive psychiatrist and columnist at the health news organization, Stat News. Jennifer? So um, I'm so excited to be here today to um, moderate this important conversation as a collaboration between STAT and the 19th. And, um, you know, part of the mission of the 19th is to, you know, empower the readers, like particularly women and women of color um, and people of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and they really want to uh, create conversations that empower people to make informed decisions to better empower our democracy. Um, and so I'm really thankful to like be part of this important conversation with our two powerhouse uh, panelists today. Um, and so I just kind of want to ground the conversation in the ideas of like reproductive justice. I know it's something that both of you feel very passionate about. 
Um, and like, just, just for our audience, um, reproductive justice is, you know, it can be defined as the complete like physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, political, economic well-being of like women and girls or those who identify, you know, as, as, as women and girls and being empowered to make decisions about your own body, not just about, you know, reproduction, but um, your sexuality, your ability to make choices for yourself and have the best chance in life. And I think when everybody has the best chance in life, that's when, you know, democracy thrives. And so I just kind of want to you know, kick off the conversation with Dr. Marsh. You know, we're 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 talking about these two big topics today in in women's health, um, uh, fibroids and endometriosis. Um, they're very common um, conditions. And even for myself as a physician, you know, I I didn't learn much about this stuff in in in, in med medical school. And you know, encountering patients, I've just kind of learned about it along the way, which is kind of sad in a way. Um, and so I just kind of want to, you know, punt to Dr. Marsh, like, what are these conditions? And if I was a patient coming to you, how would you explain this to me? Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Puerico. Um, you know, fibroids and endometriosis are, as you said, two incredibly common conditions. They're two of the most common gynecological conditions that, that, um, uh, individuals that, that um, are born with the uterus um, uh, can have. I'll start with endometriosis. Endometriosis affects about 10% um, of, um, of, uh, of female patients. Um, it's associated with uh, chronic pelvic pain, particularly during the menses or during menstruation, but the pain can happen at any point. Um, uh, it's also uh, associated with infertility. Uh, due to the scarring and the inflammation that it can that it can cause, um, it's it's an incredibly debilitating condition because of its primary symptoms, and unfortunately, despite its prevalence, um, uh, uh, patients report uh, taking it taking seven to nine years on average before it gets diagnosed, um, and um, uh, even though it's it's not as prevalent as fibroids, it's still the number one cause of hysterectomy in women under 35, which is, which, you know, is problematic um, to say the least. Uh, in terms of fibroids, um, fibroids are, are benign, meaning non-cancerous um, tumors or masses in the wall of the uterus or the wall of the, of the womb, the muscular wall. Um, they can be uh, tiny, you know, they can be microscopic or they can be as large as you know my head, or or, or even larger sometimes, um, uh, they are the leading cause of hysterectomy. Period in the United States, and um, uh, you know, um, while endometriosis is prevalent, fibroids are highly prevalent. When you look at 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 individuals born with the uterus, by the age of fifty, about sixty-five to seventy percent of of um, uh, of those individuals will will have a fibroid either on ultrasound or you know um, they may have had a hysterectomy for them, um, but they will have fibroids or have had fibroids. Um, and if you're of African ancestry, um, your chances of having a fibroid are even higher by the age of fifty. They're between eighty-five and ninety percent. Um, um, why are fibroids a leading cause of hysterectomy? Um, it's because of their symptoms they cause. The most significant one is heavy menstrual bleeding, um, very heavy periods that can lead to anemia, fatigue, need for iron infusions, blood transfusions. Um, um, they can also call pain, cause pain, excuse me. Um, they can be associated with infertility. They can be associated with recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, and they can cause you know, bloating and, and kind of vague symptoms that you're just not sure you know, what you're dealing with. Um, but in, when you look at the full constellation, the symptoms will vary depending on the size of the fibroids and the location of the fibroids. Um, and, you know, net, net, they, they, they um, you know, they're hugely problematic. And despite their prevalence, a lot of people don't know about them until they get their diagnosis. And similar to endometriosis, there's, there's, there's a delay in, um, uh, there's a late in diagnosis, um, uh, you know, despite how common they are, the fact that they're bread and butter, OBGYN really, um, there are many uh, individuals who don't 
you know, who aren't told that they have fibroids until they have symptoms for years. Mm -hmm. And we have to change that. Yeah, I, I think I read an article about about you. Was it on the University of Michigan like website that kind of talked about how you had memories of going to the hospital with your mom visiting aunties who had had fibroid surgery. And so this seems like it has both professional and personal salience for you um, as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think uh, any um, you know anybody of of African ancestry is 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 touched by fibroids directly or indirectly. Um, you you know you know somebody who's dealing with them. You're dealing with them yourself. Um, many times both are the case. And I I just you know my earliest remembrance is just. Um, uh, you know, going to people's, my mom going to people's houses and, you know, taking meals, taking the casserole and, um, uh, you know, at a certain point, her, her peer group started having, many of her peer groups started having, his, at the time I didn't realize what was happening, but started having hysterectomies for fibroids. So, so I think it is um, in some ways kind of part of the fabric of being, um, uh, um, you know, being, you know, self-identifying as female, um, but even when you don't self-identify as female, if, you, if you're born with the uterus, then, then fibroids, fibroids can affect you, um, yeah. regardless of how you self-identify. And so um, uh, definitely um, became familiar with them in ways I, I didn't even realize early in life. And now they, they continue to be kind of a passion point for me because because of their prevalence because of their impact on quality of life because we don't have the treatments that we should have for them um, because um, patients don't always realize their options um, and because we you know we have to do better as a field yeah yeah these these conditions they really do impact you know like you said every everybody that has has a has a uterus should be aware of them just because of the absolutely impact. and you mentioned one in ten um, you know, people with a uterus identify or like, you know, struggles with endometriosis. And we, we, you know, we have Congresswoman Williams with us today. And uh, I was wondering if you could help us like put a human face and story to this condition. Like tell, tell us, tell us what your experience has been. No, absolutely. One of my goals is to demystify Congress. And sometimes that means sharing things that I didn't really think that I would be sharing with the entire country, but here I am talking about me suffering from endometriosis since I was 14 years old. I remember going, like just listening to the conversations with the two medical ex experts here. And I remember going to the doctor at 14 because my periods were so painful. And initially you're told that, you know, you're supposed to have this pain and try to normal. And it's, it was tried to be normalized. And I actually remember one of my doctors, the very first doctor asking my mom if I was exaggerating the pain oh. instead of trying to figure out what was going on with me. Oh. It was so bad at that point. I was in high school and I would have to miss days of school because the pain was just so bad. And I remember being given um, like the opioids just to like treat the pain. And then all I would do was sleep all day. And so I, I mean, so many things, but I had a mama who was not willing to just listen to that first doctor. And I had to go to a different doctor before I finally got a diagnosis and had the first of many laparoscopic surgeries to number one, be diagnosed and to burn off the lesions. But it is, I'm glad that we frame this conversation in the reproductive justice framework, because what that doctor told me as a teenager was one way to stop this and to get rid of it and treat my endometriosis was to have a hysterectomy oh. as a teenager. And in the reproductive framework, it's not about just your decision to not parent, but having the option to parent. And so I'm the mom of a very, very vibrant six-year-old boy who, if I or my mom had listened to those doctors at the time, I wouldn't have my little Carter Cakes, um, who keeps us all on our toes in our house. And I mean, I just, I am fighting and bringing awareness to this because I want other people to have those options when they get to that first doctor's appointment, not having to go to multiple doctors, not having to be asked if they're exaggerating their pain or their symptoms be dismissed or being told as a teenager that they should have a hysterectomy. And right. so I'm fortunate 
to have had a mom who pushed back and made sure that I got um, a second opinion and finally a doctor who listened to me and listened to the symptoms that I was experiencing and got a diagnosis. But that's not the case for so many women. And that's why I continue to push and continue to fight as a member of the United States Congress to bring awareness. Yeah, yeah. No, you brought up so many, um, so many interesting points. I think, you know, one of the ones that hit home for me is this idea of were you exaggerating your period pain, right? We have these conversations, we're trying to empower young women. Um, and I think it's almost, it creates this catch-22 situation. Like, oh, you know, don't skip school because your period, like period pain is normal, like don't be weak. But, you know, there's that whole narrative, right? And then that leads to some negative consequences. People not telling others about their symptoms or they kind of suffer in silence. And then on the other side, you know, you have people who do complain and then get shut down, right? And so you kind of have this catch 22 when people are complaining of these symptoms around menstruation, there's almost like a taboo or, uh, you know, you know something about that in, um, that can really lead to negative consequences. And so I guess for both of you, what, what, what should people do if they don't have mamas who push back? You know, like what, what should doctors, what should doctors be aware of Dr. Marsh and what should, what should patients be aware of? You know, how do we empower or change the conversation on both ends of the table? The exam table, if you will. <laughs> so one thing that I know that I have an obligation to do as a lawmaker and a policymaker in this country is to use my voice and my lived experience to get the funding and the research. We just increased the funding for endometriosis research by $93 million in this year's appropriations bill. So I was very excited. I relaunched the endometriosis caucus in Congress to bring other members on board. And this isn't just a, a caucus for people that may or may not have been born with a uterus. I need everybody involved in this conversation because it takes all of us to advocate for our people. And then just this past week, I was super excited to join President Biden in the Oval Office. I was a little giddy, y'all, because I'd never been in the Oval <laughs> Office before, but in the Oval Office to sign um, research grants for um, minority health research for conditions that disproportionately affect people of color. And so Morehouse School of Medicine is going to be a recipient of these funds. I had the head of the National Institute of Minority Health with me on board and Secretary Becerra, and I'm continuing to use my voice to bring awareness to conditions that disproportionately impact people of color. That's what our decision makers need to do. And that gives the doctors, like you said, um, Dr. Jennifer, you were, when you were in, I'm trying to not mess up your last name, but when you were in medical school, these were conditions that you weren't necessarily trained to learn about. And so getting that, these funds to our institutions that so that doctors in training can get the, the information and the tools that they need to properly diagnose people. And I mean, I am just proud to have doctors like you on this Zoom with me, experts who are leading the way and making sure that our lived experiences and our conditions and our pain are like we're being heard and seen and getting the proper treatments and not just being told as a 14 year old that if I want to get rid of this pain, I should have a hysterectomy. Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's so interesting. Like one of the things that I've, you know, learned along the way is that endometriosis is not just a pelvic disease, like it can have many manifestations throughout the body, like even, you know, neurological manifestations, like pulmonary, like, manifestations and so it, it's just so interesting that you know this disease is kind of pushed or uh, as like oh, a women's problem or you know people with a uterus problem and and it's just pure just just period pain right um but it's but it's more than that i remember during medical school having um, you know, every unit we had the HIV thread and because HIV has all these like manifestations throughout the body. And so when we were in cardiology, we learned the manifestations there. When we were in pulmonology, when we were in end, uh, like immunology, and there was no such thing for such a systemic disease as, you know, endometriosis as well. So I'm, you know, with all this new research and funding for education, I'm wondering if schools could kind of pick up that thread and kind of catch that ball and keep, you know, keep it, keep it running. Um, so to the other side of the exam table, Dr. Marsh, what do you think doctors should know? Like, how do we empower ourselves to recognize 
both fibroids and endometriosis in our patients and what needs to change, like what do doctors need to take ownership of? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that um, uh, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, uh, places where this conversation kind of touches on issues around reproductive justice. One is, you know, having the right care for the right patient at the right time. Um, and, um, um, and another is just how, how we're trained in medicine to kind of frame, frame the patient doctor interaction and, and thinking about how we potentially need to reframe that. I mean, we, it, it was interesting listening, uh, uh, to, to both of you talking about, um, patient complaints and just that language, like we have to change, like patients aren't complaining. Patients are telling you or telling right. us what they have. They're, they're sharing their, but that's just, that's just a traditional, you know, patient, patient complains of da, 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 da. And words matter. I think language matters. And just, just starting by simply reframing, you know, my patient isn't complaining. My patient is here because, you know, we're in a trusted relationship. Um, mm -hmm. They want to, me to bring my expertise to bear and let them know what they're, what I think is happening, what I, what the treatment options are and to, to, you know, work together to come up with, with a treatment plan that works best for them. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of education that needs to be done. You know, I would say 360 degrees. Um, uh, I, I consider um, uh, fibroids in particular, but also endometriosis, their public health, you know, those, those are things that need to be pushed out at the public health level. Um, um, any condition, there are not a lot of conditions that we can say 70% of, of women will have by the age of 50. They're just, you know, they're, they're not. Um, and yet, if you ask folks how many, how many people know about fibroids and heard about fibroids, the number is in, in, in the general public, the number is, 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 is quite small. And um, uh, I, so I think we need to do a better job with, with education from a public health and a, and a um, uh, health education perspective. Um, uh, we need to do better, a better job, certainly um, letting uh, training, training healthcare providers particularly those that don't specialize or focus on, on, um, on what we traditionally call women's health. Um, uh, uh, um, so that, you know, you may, maybe you're at the ophthalmologist or the orthopedic surgeon, but if you say, you know, I know this isn't what you do, but I've been having, you know, my periods have been heavy. You know, everybody should be able to say, ah, you should go talk, you know, you should go see your OBGYN or maybe start with your primary care. And, and see if you have fibroids. Um, or if, if the complaint is, you know, I've, 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 you know, if the concern I should say is, you know, I've, I've been having this, this chronic pain, pelvic pain for years, um, you know, endometriosis should be top of mind for any healthcare provider and somebody to say, oh, well, you should, you should talk to your primary care doctor. You should talk to your OBGYN. See if you have, see if they think you might have endometriosis. Now, having those symptoms don't mean that you have these two diseases, okay? But it's certainly worth a conversation. It's worth bringing up, having that conversation. You know, Dr. X, do you think I might have, you know, this, this condition? Because I'm having these symptoms. You know, can we do a workup? How would you evaluate? Would you treat me empirically? Um, you know, having the conversation matters, recognizing what's normal and what's not normal um, as, as patients matters, understanding that it's not normal to have a period that lasts 20 days. It's not normal to need to double up on ultra tampons and ultra <laughs> pads and worry about, um, you know, having concerns and feeling limited about being out socially during your period because of pain or because of the amount of bleeding you're having. Um, we all deserve better than that. Our families and the people who love us want better, better than that for us. And um, we can do better than that. When we, you know, when we know better, we can do better. And so I think uh, fundamentally we have to, we have to change the way we, we educate one another. And when that starts, 
um, so that we can we can be empowered, whether or not you have MD or PhD in front of your name or uh, behind your name or Congresswoman in front of your name, like, you know, beyond us, we want to make sure that everybody, everybody, um, you know, has a sense of like, these are these conditions, they're highly prevalent. Um, I may or may not have them, but if I have these symptoms, I'm going to I'm going to ask my healthcare provider about them and, and, and get their input, see what they think, see if there can be an evaluation. Yeah. So, so I guess a question for both of you, something that you, you know, you both have touched on. Does this education, does it start in like with like pediatrics? Does it start, you know, you, Congresswoman, you said you just came from a school and like you share your story. Is it is it that we've got to educate people early, like early in life? So I, I think it is um, us recognizing that we that young girls are starting their cycles earlier. And I look at my niece who spent the holidays with me and she's 12 and she spent um, some time with me over Christmas. And I remember talking to my sister about the pain that she was having with her period. And I'm like, we should you should take her to the doctor and make sure that, you know, have them like just have a conversation with her about endometriosis, especially knowing what I've been through and now seeing her not even be able to go out and hang out with her other cousins because she was in so much pain and um, just sitting doubled over in pain. And so that is something that we have to be aware of even earlier, because if you're starting your cycles earlier, then we need to be diagnosing people and looking out for the symptoms earlier. And so, yes, we, that's why the research is so critical. And that's why I am just, I'm so super excited y'all to be on this zoom today with two experts who really get it and really understand how important it is to allow people to come in and believe people, believe patients when they explain what they're experiencing and take the proper actions to make sure that they're getting the treatment that they deserve. Um, it's so wonderful, Congresswoman, about your, your, your spearheading of this like, research funding. What strikes me is that, you know, it's, it's, it's 2022 and maybe this was your, maybe this was your destiny, but from what I understand, like, endometriosis is described in the medical literature like a hundred years ago. And it seems like it's been slow going. Um, Dr. Marsh, I know you spend a lot of your time and your, your, your professional effort in, in the research world, like advocating for um, you know, like health disparities through your work. Can you, can you both like kind of weigh in and, and help us understand like why there's been such a, a, a lag in our understanding of these conditions, our education and advocacy, and even the research funding, like it's 2022 and, and it's, you know, this push is happening now and this, at least endometriosis was described a hundred years ago. Absolutely. I, you know, I think both of these conditions are so reflective of the challenge and impact of health disparities, but in two different ways. And I'm going to start with endometriosis. You're right. Endometriosis was described in the literature um, you know, more than a century ago. Um, and it was described as a disease of essentially upper-class white women. And that initial description continues to impact who gets diagnosed with endometriosis and who gets diagnosed with pelvic inflammatory disease, for example. Mm, and yeah. so there's, you know, we don't actually know a lot about endometriosis in African-American women in particular, because it is, it is very likely undiagnosed, underdiagnosed, I should say, um, because the assumption, um, and you know, I think about uh, all the, all the um, young women in particular who are, who are going to the emergency room for care, you know, who may not have that trusted ongoing relationship with their primary care doc or with OBGYN, and who, you know, and you know, it it's their their job is to triage, to make a diagnosis and to to treat with what they, you know, what they think is is the most effect, effective and efficient treatment. Um, and you know, it that that ma it matters whether you are labeled on your chart with having pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a complication typically of, of sexually transmitted infection. Um, uh, um, you know, and all of the unconscious and quite frankly, conscious bias that will 
for you know forever goes with that versus oh you have endometriosis um you know let's 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 give you this this and this let's you know let's treat you differentially let's admit you let's make sure you have the appropriate follow up and I, I i think that we have to you know even though a report um was uh was um a uh, follow-up article or article was published in follow-up or in response to the kind of traditional views of endometriosis, highlighting that um, it was a case series that was published out of, I think, Michael Reese Hospital by an African-American physician um, about, about probably 40 years ago now saying, you know, I took this series of African-American women who had chronic pelvic pain to the OR and they, you know, this percentage of them were found to have endometriosis. You know, even with that, those data, um, there's still a bias um, in who, who we diagnose with what and how we treat them in healthcare. Now we go to fibroids, where we know that fibroids are more prevalent in, in, in individuals of African ancestry. Um, and I think the flip side is, you know, relatively little is being done. You know, how do we have a disease where we know eight to nine out of 10 Black women will have this disease. Now, not all of them will have symptoms, but eight of nine, uh, eight or nine out of 10 Black women will have this condition by the age of 50. And we know, you know, relatively little about it. Um, and when you ask, why is there still a little investment? Why is there um, so little understanding of the lived experience, the patient experience? relative to other diagnoses and conditions that are much, much, much less prevalent, um, you know, it raises the issues of, who, you know, who do we care about um, in society? Who do we value? Whose health do we value? Who's, who are we comfortable saying, just get a hysterectomy and mm -hmm. get it taken care of? And who, who do we feel comfortable ingraining that mentality in? We did, we um, interviewed about 60 individuals, most of whom were African-American, and published a series of articles on lived experience. And it's, you know, it's, it's generational now, the expectation, oh, just get a hysterectomy because that's what, you know, that's what we do. Um, and that's not okay. And I'm not anti-hysterectomy. I think for, for some individuals who have a uterus, that is the right treatment. If you look at all the options and it's a time in your life and you've done with childbearing or decided that you're not interested in childbearing and you're okay not having a uterus and the removal of your uterus is gonna be a definitive treatment and take care of your symptoms, then, then, then fine. But what's happening is that, and what, what I hear as a, as a provider that folks come to for a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion is that people are saying, I actually don't want a hysterectomy. I haven't started my family. I haven't, you know, I do want to have children. Well, I just want to hold on to my uterus because it's mine. And that's, that's enough, you know, um, and are being still told repeatedly, just have a hysterectomy. And we, we have to stop doing that. Um, it's not our job to have our patients do what we want them to do. It's our job to say, these are the options. These are the risks and benefits of the options. In my expert opinion, this is what I recommend. What's going to be what's what, what's going to be worse? Or what's going to be best for you? Excuse me. And and um, you know, I think as long you know, we we certainly don't want to do harm to patients. You know that that is part of our our code of ethics as healthcare providers. We never want to do harm. But but ultimately, we have to respect patient autonomy. And if a patient says, um, I hear you, Dr. Marsh, you're recommending this. I actually want to try this. I understand the risk and benefits of all the options and I want to try this. I'm like, okay, we're going to try that then. And we're going to see how that goes. And we're going to reassess in a few months, see how your symptoms are. And if you're fine, we'll stick with that. And if you're not fine, we can revisit the options again. Like that's, I think that's where we need, that's the space we need to get in versus this is what I want you to do. You, if you're not going to do what I want you to do, then, then, then leave my office. Yeah. Well, this has been such a great conversation. You know, I've learned so much. I want to end with uh, Congresswoman Williams. Um, give us the last word. What's what? What do you what do you want us to take away from this conversation? As someone who's like, you know, struggled with one of these these conditions. The takeaway from today is healthcare equity. 
we have to make sure that we are treating people as whole people and having more practitioners, more doctors, more experts that understand our lived experiences, especially as women of color is critical. I am going to continue to advocate on my part on the policymaking level and get the research funding and get the resources that are needed. But it is important that we have practitioners who are willing to step up and make sure that our lived experiences are being recognized, our voices are being heard when we step into that, that exam room. And I'm grateful for having people like you that I can count as co-conspirators for justice, because that's what this is about. Reproductive justice is my right, not just to not parent, but the right to preserve my fertility to parent if I choose and to keep that going in every aspect of our healthcare spectrum. And so we have to continue to focus on healthcare equity. That is how we're going to continue to bring these issues to the light. And I will continue to share my lived experiences as a member of Congress who suffers monthly from endometriosis. I just today was like, I was late for this Zoom and this is probably way TMI, but I was like, I'm on my cycle right now. I got to make sure that I take care of myself because I like took my what my pain pills this morning because I have a long day ahead of me and I have to continue to function. But I understand that while as a member of Congress, I can clear my schedule and take time off from work. That is not the lived experience of so many women who are experiencing endometriosis and a day off work for them looks much different in their ability to continue to care for their family. So we have to make sure that we're always centering those most marginalized in our conversations. And I'm in this until we get a cure so that we can make sure that it's available to all people that are suffering, not just some. Thank you both so much. I've learned so much and it's uh, been a pleasure being in your, your digital presence and, uh, and having this conversation with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aquarico. Thank you, Congresswoman Williams. It's a pleasure. I'm thrilled now to introduce something really special and meaningful. Radio producer and author Stephanie Fu reading a chapter from her new book, What My Bones Know, A Memoir of Healing from Complex Trauma. Her struggle to find quality mental health care echoes the experience of so many people in our complicated healthcare system. Let's listen. In Gretchen Schmelzer's excellent, gentle book, Journey Through Trauma, she insists on the fifth page. Some of you may choose a therapist, a psychiatrist, psychologist, social worker, counselor, or member of the clergy. Some of you may choose some form of group therapy, but I'm telling you upfront at the beginning, in order to heal, you will need to get help. I know you will try to look for the loophole in this argument, try to find a way that you can do this on your own, but you need to trust me on this. If there were a way to do it on your own, I would have found it. No one looked harder for that loophole than I did. After my diagnosis, I looked for that lo loophole too for a while. After I started realizing the magnitude of what having CPTSD meant, I was livid at my therapist, Samantha, for not telling me about it sooner. This should not have been a secret, I thought. My diagnosis should have been a critical part of the conversation about my mental health this entire time. I wrote to Samantha telling her my feelings, asking why she hadn't been more open about CPTSD. She explained that she had brought it up during our first session, but that was eight years ago. Our first session was so strange and new for me, I'm sure I'd miss that one little word of difference, complex. In terms of why it never again came up, Samantha said that whenever I was in a depressive state, she didn't want to add to my burden by bringing up the weight of my diagnosis. And whenever I was happy, she didn't want to cloud my joy. She was protecting me, she insisted. And she saw now that it might have been the wrong decision, even though it was made with love. I thanked her for her explanation and for her help over the years. But as grateful as I was for her love and support, I knew I couldn't see her anymore. This lack of communication bordered on deception for me. I needed someone new. I knew that a superb therapist could point me in the direction of healing. I'd benefited so much from Samantha's help over the years. I knew that in the right therapist's office, I could feel safe, but I really, really did not want to look for one. Finding a person to declare your craziest, most profound insecurities to is not exactly a picnic, but the bureaucratic idiocy of America's healthcare system turns what should be a chore into torture. If you're a middle-class person in America, the dance goes like this. 
you call your insurance provider to find the meager list of therapists who take your insurance. Most of the people on the list are licensed clinical social workers or licensed mental health counselors. They can be wonderful and very helpful, but they often have less schooling and experience than, say, psychologists and PhDs. After digging deeper, you find that some of these therapists don't take your insurance after all. Others have full client lists. And even if they do have space in the day to treat someone, they might not be interested in treating you. According to one study, a low-income Black person had an up to an 80% lower chance of receiving a callback for an appointment than a middle-class white person. And even though intellectually, therapists tell you that anger can be a helpful and legitimate emotion in processing trauma, God forbid you actually seem angry on the phone. Several mental health professionals have told me that therapists often avoid rageful clients because they seem threatening or scary. Therapists instead prefer to take on Yavis, young, attractive, verbal, intelligent, and successful clients. They love an amenable type, someone who is curious about their internal workings and eager to plumb them, someone who's already read articles in the New Yorker about psychology to familiarize them with the language of metacognition and congruence. Good luck if you're a regular ass Joe who'd rather watch It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But say you get lucky and find a licensed clinical psychologist with an open slot. The psychologist is white, of course, 86% of psychologists in the United States are, which isn't ideal if you're a person of color, but fine, whatever. You just need to receive an official diagnosis for your insurance. You are certain you have complex PTSD, but he can't diagnose you with that because it's not in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Your insurance only covers treatment for conditions listed in the DSM in order to assign a number of sessions to you. Most forms of insurance will pay for, say, only six months of therapy relating to anxiety, 10 for depression, as if you should be better by then. Another consequence of CPTSD not being in the DSM, the psychologist hasn't been trained in treating it. He says he doesn't believe that it's a real diagnosis. He'd like to provide you with some questionnaires to see if Maybe you have something he can actually handle, bipolar disorder or manic depression. This does not inspire confidence, so you leave. After some internet sleuthing, you find a woman of color who seems really cool. She's specifically trained in the treatment of complex trauma. She has blurbs on her website that resonate with you. It seems as if she might truly understand you, but she doesn't take insurance. Psychologists are the least likely of any medical provider to take insurance, only about 45% of them do. And most of the time, the ones who don't are the most qualified practitioners. You can't exactly blame her. You learn on the internet that insurance companies haven't updated reimbursement rates for therapists in up to 20 years, despite rising rates for office rent and other administrative costs. If therapists were to rely on reimbursement rates from insurance alone, they'd wind up making about $50,000 a year on average, which is fine, but like, not great if you're an actual doctor. So this awesome lady therapist says she charges $250 per 45 minute session. If you see her once a week, that's your rent. How much am I willing to pay in order to be happy? You ask yourself, is it worth spending a thousand dollars a month? Is it worth going into debt to be happy? You could spend a luxe weekend in Miami every month for that much money. Maybe that would make you happy too. You go back to the psychologist who doesn't believe your diagnosis, figuring he's your only real option. He diagnoses you as having a major depressive disorder. But even though you work with him for months, you don't seem to be getting better. You start to think that's your fault, that you're beyond help. You're just too broken to be fixed. When you eventually drop out, you feel like a failure. Or let's say you receive a magical inheritance of a few thousand dollars and you can find whatever therapist you want. Even then, the process is not necessarily easy. You might find yourself rejecting a perfectly fine, competent therapist because he has a face that stresses you out, or because he seems overly judgmental, or because she accidentally CC'd you and all of her other clients instead of using BCC, exposing everyone's email addresses, and now you don't know if you can trust her again. These aren't bad reasons to leave a therapist. You want to find someone you can trust, someone you truly vibe with. Just like with dating, except without any of the booze, sex, or fun, finding your match can take time. And just like dating, even if finding the perfect person might be life-affirming, the process itself can be so demoralizing that you wonder whether it's even worth it.
I had a couple of bad therapists when I was in college, a man with a bow tie who tried to hit on me, a woman who sighed at every turn of my childhood as if it were a Dickensian tragedy. There was a psychiatrist who tried to put me on Prozac. I quoted Brave New World. I want to know what passion is. I want to feel something strongly. The psychiatrist responded, I think that passion might be a chemical imbalance. And then luckily I found Samantha. Now I needed someone new. I felt equally equipped to find a good therapist at 30 as I did at 19. I Googled complex PTSD therapist NYC and went to the first person listed, a man who promised he could cure anyone within three months. He charged $200 an hour, but over the course of only 12 sessions, that seemed like a deal. I got through only one session with him. In that one hour, he barely listened to a word I said. He talked twice as much as I did and kept interrupting me every time I said some key trauma word, pathologizing me with all the enthusiasm of a golden retriever playing Frisbee. Oh, I see. You rely on your boyfriend for stability. That means you are codependent, overly needy. Ah, but he was in a bad place when you met him and you helped him too. That means you're only attracted to chaos and broken birds. I didn't care if it was only supposed to last three months. I didn't want each of my therapy sessions to feel like an episode of Jeopardy where he raced to answer all of my questions before even hearing what they were. I paid him his exorbitant sum and spent the next two months trying to recover from being lambasted by his pathologies, shouting to myself in quiet moments, codependent, needy, you only love brokenness. I only went to one session with another therapist because she was the opposite, too quiet. She barely responded to anything I said in our sessions, just kept asking, so how does that make you feel? Ugh, how boring. I could do that to myself at home for free. Another woman seemed competent, but she butt dialed me later that afternoon and left me a long voicemail. It was a drawn out negotiation between her and her child. No, mommy won't give you anything unless you clean your room. No, you need to go poop without mommy. The child was winning. I never called her back, which admittedly was unfair, but I didn't think I could walk into her office and pretend I hadn't listened to her laboriously debating her child's poop. At the same time, in my readings, I discovered some evidence that traditional talk therapy might not actually be particularly effective for complex PTSD. In The Body Keeps the Score, Van der Kolk writes about how talk therapy can be useless for those whom traumatic events are almost impossible to put into words. Some people are too dissociated and distanced from these traumatic experiences for talk therapy to work well. They might not be able to access their feelings, let alone convey them. For others, they're in such an activated state that they have a hard time reaching into difficult memories, and the very act of recalling them could be re-traumatizing. One study showed that about 10% of people might experience worsening symptoms after being forced to talk about their trauma. Between 40% and 60% of people drop out of therapy at some point. Most drop out within the first two sessions. And plenty of statistics show that even pointed skills-based talk therapy is ineffective for PTSD. Cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, a form of talk therapy where patients unlearn negative patterns of behavior and try to practice strategically positive patterns is widely accepted as a treatment for PTSD but it has abysmal statistics. In one study of 74 patients, eight got better with CBT, compared with four who received no therapy at all. Still, one of my friends with complex PTSD, Lacey, mentioned that her therapist had helped her significantly. She said her therapist helped her restructure her life, creating boundaries and allowing her to take good care of herself, which again reminded me of dating. It seems like the worst thing in the world, an absolute waste of time until you find your person. And then all that effort, all that complaining and crying, it all becomes worth it, right? I really hoped it would all be worth it.
Thank you, Stephanie, for sharing your experience with us. While this part of her story was quite a struggle, Stephanie did go on to find meaningful mental health care and writes about her path to healing in her book. Next up, what's it like to navigate health care with a disability? Consider the fact that just 3% of doctors report having a disability and think about what that means for representation and empathy in care. Here to discuss this, we have Dr. Lisa Iazoni, a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the associate director of the Institute for Health Policy at Massachusetts General Hospital. Dr. Iazoni will be in conversation with Sarah Luderman, caregiving reporter for the 19th. Sarah? Hello. Uh, I'm happy to be here today with Dr. Elisa Iazoni to discuss disbarriers and barriers faced by both doctors and patients with disabilities. Welcome, Dr. Iazoni. It is so great to have you as, with us here today. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So I'd like to start off with a broader question about the kinds of disparities patients with disabilities face in the healthcare system. As one of the foremost experts on healthcare disparities for people with disabilities, as well as a person with a disability herself, what are the major barriers that patients face when accessing healthcare? There are quite a few of them. Um, one of the first, though, is that people with disability are disadvantaged in social determinants of health. Um, they have lower access to education, income, employment, health literacy, transportation, um, and all of those factors really do affect their ability to get, for example, screening and preventive services. Um, they typically have higher rates of health insurance, interestingly enough, and that is because of social safety net insurance, like Medicaid and Medicare under disability. But I think one of the other kind of major um, problems that they have is that doctors don't recommend kind of screening services to people with disabilities. And this is not just in the United States, this is worldwide. And a lot of this is because of ableist or discriminatory attitudes of physicians toward people with disability. So that's just a brief start. We can go deeper. Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, you mentioned screening services. So um, I guess that also brings to mind, what are some of the issues specifically facing women with disabilities? Um, two screening services that are highly rated by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. In other words, they're really, really good screening services, and pretty much all women should get them at certain ages, are pap tests to prevent cervical cancer and mammograms to early detect or prevent uh, breast cancer. And um, one of the major problems to getting a pap test actually is just getting onto the exam table. I cannot tell you how many women I've interviewed over the years who have said that they've never had a pap test because their physician hasn't been able to get them out of their wheelchair and onto an exam table. And one of the problems with pap tests is, as you probably know, human papillomavirus is responsible for many cervical cancers. It's a sexually transmitted disease. And a lot of doctors have the erroneous assumption that people with disability are not sexually active and are therefore not at risk of being exposed to human papillomavirus. And so they might often not even recommend a pap test to a woman um, or a person with a disability who needs one. Um, and then also for mammography, a lot of the problems have to do with accessibility of mammogram equipment. Um, for example, if I don't know how many of your audience will ever have had a mammogram, but trust me, it requires kind of an acrobatic sense. You have to position yourself in all these kind of weird positions and you have to hold yourself there. And, um, and that's really, really hard to do um, if you have a physical disability. And also if you have, for example, a hearing um, related disability, oftentimes when you're undergoing a mammogram, the um, technician will ask you to hold your breath. But if you can't hear when they ask you to hold your breath, you're not gonna know when to hold your breath. And you aren't also going to know when you can breathe again. And so I've heard from women who are deaf that, um, that having a mastectomy can be a really terrible experience because they simply cannot follow the instructions because they cannot, they have not had an effective communication accommodation to know when they need to breathe and hold their breath. Uh, so in January, you published an article in Health Affairs about doctors' awareness of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, 
for, for viewers who aren't familiar, it's a three decades old civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. It also requires uh, accommodations. Some of the ones that are more obvious are things like ramps or, or doors that are wide enough for a wheelchair to fit through or, or braille um, on signs. Um, so Dr. Aizoni, in your research, um, you found that over a third of doctors had little to no knowledge of their legal obligations to disabled patients under the ADA. Um, can you talk about a little bit about the, what those legal obligations are and what this means for patients with disabilities when it comes to accessing care? Well, their legal obligation, quite simply, is to provide equal quality care to people with disability as they provide to other people. And one of the ways that they do that is by making appropriate accommodations so that care can be equitable. And the accommodations, for example, um, the example that I just gave you for somebody who has a hearing um, disability and cannot hear during a mammography is to have um, a sign language interpreter in the room properly shielded and so they are not exposed to radiation. Um, for the person who has a physical disability and a difficulty getting into and positioning themselves with the um, mammography equipment, it's to have a wheelchair accessible mammogram equipment. Um, however, a lot of physicians, the, the, the take home, major take home finding for me from that particular study was the 71% of physicians who do not know who determines what reasonable accommodations should be. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that question is it's a collaboration. It's supposed to involve a discussion between the care providers, the clinicians, the doctors and nurses, and the patient, or in certain circumstances, the patient's trusted caregiver. And so it really requires doctors talking to their patients and listening to them and actually kind of doing what they ask to be done, you know, to make sure that they are accommodated for whatever healthcare intervention they need. Um. So last year you published another study um, that showed over 80% of doctors uh, believe that people with significant disabilities have worse quality of life than people with non than quality of life than non-disabled people. Um, so we know from research that most disabled people feel that they have good quality of life. Um, personally, as a person with a disability, I feel like my quality of life is, is good. Um, so this shows a huge rift in perception between like how doctors and patients think about whether disabled lives are worth living. How does this impact quality of care for people with disabilities and what can be done to repair the problem? Well, thank you for highlighting that finding, Sarah, because that was for me the shocker finding from the entire study. Although as we talked about before, we already knew this in the disability community, but at least now we have a number to quantify it. And 82% is a lot of doctors. And it basically shows erroneous assumptions and misimpressions about um, how people value their lives. And the thing that I think is most concerning here is that there are also implicit and explicit biases that we know for racial and ethnic minorities affect their quality of care, that they don't get certain services because of these kind of biases. Unable, we, we were unable in our survey to look specifically at that question, you know, does the implicit bias mean that you're not going to provide a pap test or mammogram? But we can be pretty sure that it does affect um, the health care that people receive. And I recently did a lit search and a review article on cancer care for people with disability. And this is basically a worldwide problem that's talked about, that patients with disability may get less intensive care for their cancer than other patients might, or they might have their cancer identified at a later stage because the physicians don't really pay that much attention to the symptoms that they come to the doctor with. So I think that um, I don't have any way to quantify what the experiences are, but we do know that there may be delays in diagnosis, um, worse quality of care. And we do have some sense that patients are more likely, for example, we did a study relating to breast cancer that women with disabilities with breast cancer are more likely to die of their breast cancer than are other women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 
also think about that study a lot, um, just you know, as someone for whom that's relevant. Um, so uh, in the same study, only 40% of doctors uh, reported feeling confident in their ability to provide the same quality of care to disabled patients. What are some of the reasons that they gave for that? Um, and how might those reasons be addressed? Yeah, so yeah, 41% or so of doctors felt strongly confident. That was the top line finding that we were looking at, which is kind of shocking because that means that 60% don't. Um, we were unable in our survey, Sarah, to ask why they felt that way. Mm -hmm. But um, we did ask about whether training and education was a problem um, that they felt that they didn't get adequately trained. And interestingly enough, some did, but it wasn't the overwhelming majority. I mean, it wasn't 60% who felt that they didn't get adequately trained. So we don't really know why this is at this point, but we do have to sense that it may be related to their attitudes or it may be related to their training. So there aren't a lot of disabled doctors out there, um, although that does appear to be changing. You became disabled early in your career in the 1980s before there even was an Americans with Disabilities Act. Yeah. So what were things like for you and other doctors with disabilities then? And how has disability shaped your career trajectory? Okay, Sarah, you're making an assumption here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, it's reasonable. It's totally reasonable because I have an MD after my name. So technically, yeah, I am a doctor. Um, but I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis during my first semester of medical school. And the medical school in its infinite wisdom, you know, in 1983, when I went to talk to my um, internship advisor to prepare for applying for an internship and residency to become a licensed physician, said that the medical school had decided in its infinite wisdom that they would not write a letter of recommendation for me. So I was never able to go on and become a practicing doctor. So I've never practiced a day in my life. Um, however, you are absolutely right that there are an increasing number of people with disability um, getting into the medical profession. Often some become disabled during their medical training as I did, but now because of the ADA, the medical school has to figure out how to accommodate them, you know, so they can actually complete it and go on for their internship or residency. Um, but there are still a lot of barriers to getting into medical school. And one of the barriers is the technical standards barrier that a lot of medical schools require that by the end of graduation, a person will be able to do, you know, a sl whole slew of different things um, that somebody with a disability may be able to do if they have an accommodation of, for example, a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner who can assist them with that task, but may not be able to independently do it. And so this is still kind of something that I think um, medical educators are going to be confronting over the next few years to begin to figure out what in fact do we need to make sure that a graduate of a medical school can do independently versus if they have an accommodation to be able to perform that particular task. So why is it important for there to be more disabled doctors? Do you feel like disability might maybe make doctors better at treating people with disabilities in some way? Well, I think that you want to have people providing care that are representative of the communities that they're providing the care to, you know, and this is why it's so shocking that, for example, there are only 2% African American men in medical schools now, or, or some statistic like that, because, you know, we're clearly not producing the number of doctors that represent racial and ethnic minorities that we need to. And similarly, we're not um, producing anywhere near the number of people with disability that we need to. I am a little bit nervous, though, about saying that having a disabled doctor means that everything is going to be fine in terms of understanding the lived experience of disability, mm. because I very well understand the lived experience of being a person with a mobility disability, but I have no idea what it's like to have another type of a disability, like being blind or being deaf. And I don't feel comfortable 
even making any assumptions about what it's like to be blind or deaf. Mm -hmm. And so often, I don't know whether this has ever been your experience, but I've often been the only person with a disability in a room. And so people always ask me to kind of tell them about this or that aspect of disability. And I'm like, well, I can't really because I don't have a lived experience there. And so I can give you what I know from some research, but you know, that isn't what you're really asking me. So I just don't want the few disabled doctors who are now out there working to have assumptions made about them that they are necessarily going to know um, everything about disability or the yeah. lived experience. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be very tokenizing, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. Um, so... Uh, my last question is about um, your book. You have a brand new book out. Um, it's called Making Their Days Happen. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. The book is dedicated to my best friend and his longest serving personal care assistant. So my best friend is named Michael. I met him the day my scooter died and he came over and, and offered to stay with me. Um, he is a man who is um, quadriplegic. He cannot move any part of his body from his neck down. He needs about 17 hours of assistance every day to be able to, um, to perform his activities of daily living and live in his home. And Lolita was the first woman um, who, who uh, and, and mostly personal care assistants are women of color, typically low wage workers um, who typically have two or three jobs. And, um, and she was the first personal care assistant um, who started supporting him when he has primary progressive multiple sclerosis, when his PPMS got to the point where he needed supports in his home. I wrote this book because people like Michael, who enjoys his life and loves his life and wants to continue living his life, literally cannot live his life without the supports of these low wage workers who themselves have so much on their plates um, to continue kind of supporting their families and living their lives with dignity as well. And so I basically interviewed workers, I interviewed consumers, and I basically try to tell the story about what it's like to get personal care supports in the home through the stories of the people that I interviewed. I'm, I'm really excited about the, I, I'm really excited to read it. Um, it's on my, it's on my bookshelf right now. Yeah, <laughs> well, and, and it's really important to know, and this is true for everything COVID, that COVID really, really affected this. Um, because if people get COVID, they shouldn't be showing up in the homes of people that they um, are supporting. And so, as I've already said, a lot of personal care assistants are women of color. If their school age kids are now at home and they have to stay home with their school age kids, they also can't show up. And so for my friend, Michael, there would be days when he would literally text me in the morning and say, Lisa, nobody's going to be here for the next six hours. And mm -hmm. so he basically can't eat. Um, well, he eats through a feeding tube now, but he basically is not going to get any nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so it's really kind of um, a life or death type of situation. Um, and, and one that we really do need to think about as a society for how we want to support people who have lives to live, ways to contribute, but need the supports to be able to do so. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually something I've covered extensively with my journalism with the 19th. There's just so many intersecting problems and none of them are new, which is like the most frustrating part. It's just that COVID made it worse. Yeah, they, they actually go back to the settling of our country, actually, the founding era of our country, because, um, and I won't go into what happened to enslaved people who came to America who became disabled, because it's the tragedies are just horrific to think about, mm -hmm. or indigenous people who became disabled. But the European settlers had in their heads that people were supposed to be cared for if they had disability by their family members. 
And if you didn't have a family, like Michael lives alone, he doesn't have a family who can care for him. If you don't have a family, what are you going to do? And the United States has for centuries now not been able to come forward with a way of thinking about how to provide the services that are needed to support people with disability living in their homes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I know that I, there was, it felt like there was a little optimism for a while, um, at least towards the, well, I can't say the end of the pandemic because that's not accurate, but there was a little optimism for a while that maybe this might push the needle, that something might really change. Yeah, well, it was part of Biden's Build Back Better plan, um, you know, which, which we're still trying to wait and see what is going to be contained in that plan, which is basically thinking about ways to give higher wages and get people off of waiting lists for, you know, the 800,000 people or whatever on Medicaid waiting lists. Mm -hmm. But that would only really benefit those people who are on Medicaid who get the payment for their long-term services and supports and home-based care through Medicaid. And certainly there are thousands and thousands of people for whom that is the case, but there are gonna be other people who are trying to pay for this out of their meager savings or their resources. And, um, and it's tough. Um, so circling back to, uh, just circling back to, sort of the, the health disparities that people with disabilities are facing. Um, what are some of the things that you think people can do right now to improve the situation? Well, the first thing that we need is data. Um, you know, we do not routinely collect information about disability on the routine kind of data collection processes through public health through the administration of healthcare services. So for example, we usually do collect information on race and ethnicity and gender, but we do not collect information on disability. And so you can't manage what you can't measure. You know, that's the old saying that people have. And so we know most of what we know about, um, about the disparities through surveys that have been done, federal surveys, but they're always, you know, a year or two late. And, um, and it means that, for example, a healthcare provider cannot say, you know, okay, let's look at our clinics and let's look at, you know, the rates of mammography or pap tests among the people in our clinics because they don't have that data. And so I think that the first thing that we need to do is make a, co a commitment to gathering information about people with, you know, disabled people. Yeah, absolutely. Um... It's definitely something I feel like I try to do in my journalism as well, sort of just making people aware that the issues exist, because it's one thing to say like, oh, yeah, we know that happens, you know, another thing for everyone else to know that it happens. Um, so uh, we're approaching the end of our interview. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. I really appreciate it. Um, I really look forward to all of your future research. Um, it, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today, um, and I'm, I'm honored. Well, Sarah, please, it's just been my joy to have you be interested in these topics and, and care so deeply about them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ayazoni and Sarah for that fantastic conversation. 
Now let's turn our attention to queer patients and the quality of care they receive. Traditional medical training spends only a few hours on the particular needs of LGBTQ plus patients. To discuss how the medical community can be more understanding and responsive, we're joined by Dr. Renee Critchlow, the Chief Medical Officer at Codman Square Health Center and Vice Chair of Health Equity at Boston University Medical School, and Dallas Dukar, who has a background in nursing as a registered nurse and is the founding CEO of TransHealth Northampton, a health clinic in rural Massachusetts serving transgender patients. Kate Sassen, who covers LGBTQ plus communities for the 19th, will moderate. Kate? Well, thank you both so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk to you. Um, what a great panel and at a really important time to be talking about transgender health and gender affirming care. Um, I think that a great place for us to start today might just be to talk about what is gender affirming care. I feel like we've read about it so much in the news. And I just want to start for people and talk about what this care actually is, what it means, what it looks like both for youth and adults. Um, Renee, can you start us off and just tell us what is gender affirming care? That's great. And so appreciate being able to come on board. Kate, it's a great question. A lot of people have um, very different misconceptions about what that might be. And there's a there's quite a spectrum of the possibilities of what gender affirming care is. When I think about it, I'm a family physician. I do primary care, full spectrum, um, everything from delivering babies to taking care of folks in hospice. And seeing people in their lives, living consistent with who they feel they are, that's gender affirming care. And that can come in, that can come in the many different ways. So it can come in reassurance. It can come in uh, medication changes that interact with people's bodies. It can come with um, surgeries that transform people's bodies. But the biggest thing is um, finding the way to align the way a person feels who they are with how their body is. And we use all different kinds of things. And one of the things we use for the younger ages, um, since you mentioned kids, is we just slow down per puberty. We're like, as, as some kids come into puberty, their body doesn't feel like the body that they is consistent with their gender. And slowing puberty, they call it puberty blockers. They're not, they don't block it completely. They slow it down and they allow time and space for that child to develop as they would like to develop. And it's very similar with adults. When we do with adults uh, hormone replacement or um, surgeries, or even things like voice coaching and things like that, all of those are ways to align the person's physical with their spiritual and mental. And so when I think of gender affirming care, I think about allowing the person to become who they feel they are. And Dallas, can you tell us why does this care matter? Why do people need it? Well, gender affirming care really should be treated as essential care. It's not a nice to have, right? So let's stop creating adult trauma by denying gender affirming care to trans youth, right? Affirming care really intersects with every part of one's identity and it's a core feature of who someone is, right? It's not just what happens in bathrooms. It's not just what happens in gender segregated spaces, right? But really we interact with gender at all parts of our life, right? What providers we go to, what type of jobs may be available to us or not, what type of employment may be available, what type of salaries may be available. And so really gender, is something that's so innate to us, gender identity, and yet at the same time touches so many parts of life. It is really an essential component of who we are. And when we affirm someone using the right name, using the right pronoun, providing the right treatment, being able to provide the right type of comprehensive care, then we're able to set a kid or an adult up for success, right? It's such a minimal intervention using the right words using the right actions, having access to the right treatments, whether they're medical or surgical. And yet it makes such a profound difference. If we just look at some of the basics in gender affirming care, which is support and fostering support, we see huge reductions in suicidality and we see kids and adults thriving, right? So this is important because it's essential care, it's life-saving care, and it's, we know, that when we work to provide this care for trans and gender diverse folks and for all folks really, 
we can see morbidity and mortality go down along with costs to the healthcare system go down and instead see our patient population begin to flourish. And now I want to talk a little bit about, because we've talked so much about this care for kids and, and that seems to be what people maybe don't understand, right? Um, what are some of the things that people seem to be confused about or getting wrong when it comes to this care for young people? What are some of the misconceptions that you all see in your work? Renee, do you want to start us off here? Sure. Um, it's one of the biggest things people always hit on is uh, a, a child cannot consent to a medical procedure. Someone has to do that for them. Other things, um, kids don't know what they want or need. They, have, they don't know their own mind as if they're plants that we just move about. Um, big things that people express concern about. Um, will they be able to have babies if they want to in the future? And so it's, it's very interesting that there's a lot of people who appear to um, be so concerned with people they actually, honestly, I don't think they care about that much. They just want to control their existence. Whereas the child wants to grow into who they are and providing people the opportunity, it's reversible should someone change their mind. There's no indication that it affects fertility. And from my experience, um, 23 years of doing primary care medicine, uh, I've seen more people find a joyful end of the rainbow when they've transitioned to who they really are. And as you mentioned, Alice, I think that one of the biggest things that it hits on is, is, is suicidality. It's like if stopping, if delaying puberty gives a chance for a child to grow into a, you know, an adult that they want to be, I think that's worth it. One of the things that also seems to get lost is that this is not controversial in the medical community, right? This has been long settled. Um, can we talk about, you know, why, how, can you talk just a, us through a little bit about the history of how this care became the standard? What is the history and, and, and how we got to this moment where this care became sort of the golden standard for uh, trans and gender nonconforming folks? Dallas, do you want to start us with this? Sure. Yeah. So I, I, I would first say that gender affirming care, you know, it really did not arrive overnight. 15 years ago, many trans Americans really couldn't imagine what would be really included in our modern healthcare framework today. You know, in 1981, for example, Medicare really barred coverage for gender affirming surgeries and private insurers also really followed suit at that time. And since then, we've really seen a slow walk towards coverage of gender affirming care. And by 2005, California had prohibited healthcare plans from discriminating against gender identity or expression. And later the ACA, also known as Obamacare, had banned discrimination on sex, later to be interpreted as gender in 2010 too. Uh, after that, we saw HHS follow um, and really uh, in 2016, uh, in HHS rule prohibiting exclusions from gender affirming care. But really we know that trans people, regardless of that you know, 30 year history right there, trans people have been really fighting for this care for generations, right? And we have really needed to take care of ourselves when other people, whether they've been providers, whether they've been insurance companies, hospitals, clinics have been unwilling to take care of us and provide us the care that we need. We see trans individuals existing all the way back to the Neolithic era, although they were not called trans individuals then. And we have seen you know, whole centers that have existed internationally before, much before the, the past couple of generations that have really been dedicated. Uh, one of note was in Germany, right before uh, the rise of Nazi Germany. And so really, there is a long and rich history of really trans and gender diverse people, queer people, 
caring for each other in different iterations throughout human history. And it's only recently, at least in the United States, that this has then become formalized. And, and really, you know, it's not the 1970s, we saw DSM-3 considering homosexuality a mental disorder. And there were individuals who were kicked out of their residencies, kicked out of the medical establishment for being gay, right? So consider that and consider who was allowed to then be in the medical industrial complex back then. And that was 1970. So who's at the table? That's the real question I would ask, right? Who has been at the table? Who makes these decisions? And who says what is permissible or not? And since then, and then since seeing activism, since seeing political involvement, since seeing that change in coverage that I just kind of walked us through, and since seeing trans people being at the forefront of fighting for what patient-centered care should look like, we've seen the expansion of the balance of what is deemed necessary. And while there's still barriers there, we see every major medical establish every major medical organization and association coming out in support of gender affirming care. We see many, many different groups, whether they are clinical or not, coming out in support of gender affirming care. We have seen the scientific community as a whole come out in support of gender affirming care. And so gender affirming care is on the right side of history. And it's now time for a few cisgender white male politicians to get on board. So, and this is what I want to ask about, right? Like, um, I'm curious, and I'm sure you are too, why are we having this conversation right now? Like, like you know, um, I think for a lot of people, this is settled science, right? This is not controversial in the medical community. We know that. Um, what is happening right now? What, why this? Um, what do you make of this moment? What it means um, for the future of trans healthcare? And also just why do you think this is the issue that we're grappling with today? Trans kids, healthcare. I think it's about uh, fear been being manipulated on a political level. And um, there's no reason why people should care what other folks do with their body except for the fact that it's about control. And in politics, control comes with power. And the way they're developing their power is they're creating fear of the other. And fear, you know, people, it's, it's change. We're just, things are changing. And people actually don't fear change, they fear loss. And what these politicians are doing is they're telling people who are vulnerable that you're going to lose your quality of life. You're going to lose your control over your, your children. You're going to lose control over your world. And that's what they're saying when they, when they say fear any change. And when you look at trans folks, I think of it like, you know, when a lot of the diversity work I do is around race, around um, queer issues. And when you look at when things are the worst, they affect the people at the margins the most. Mm -hmm. And when I look at healthcare in this country and I look at the way trans kids are treated, I'm like, they're on the margins. And the thing is, we can learn from this. If we can create a system that allows those kids to feel safe, cared for, and affirmed, then that system will actually work better for everybody. But what a lot of people are doing right now is they're using fear as just a big stick to smash through to power. And the fact that they can say some child is going to go into a bathroom, it's like, I, it's, it's confusing to me how much time they spend thinking about other people's genitals and then saying that, you know, we're the weird people. It's like, it, it's quite all right to live and let live in the situation. I want to ask I, you, uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. No, go ahead. I, I, I'm curious, can you, can you just tell me about a moment where you saw like a trans kid who got this care and like a moment of, of, I feel like we've heard about the potential harms, but like, can you talk about what it looks like when there is a success or like a, a story that feels like really human? Well, I, I'll say that um, 
one of the things that Dallas pointed out is the length of time that we've been under this transition. Um, and unfortunately, I've seen more of the bad things than the good things. But what I've been seeing lately, um, like I am a cis woman, masculine presenting, I got a deep, awesome voice. Um, so whenever I talk to a realtor, they think I'm a white guy and they give me a really good rate. <laughs> um, but this is the thing, it's just like, I love the way I dress because I'm authentic about who I am. And when I walk into a room with a little queer kid, a little trans kid, they just, they light up because they see someone being their authentic self and that's all they want to do. That's all they want to be is be their authentic self. You don't even, it's like, you don't have to be trans to even know that. They're just like, I just want to be able to be who I am. And I'm like, okay, let's get you there. Dallas, I, you're running what is the, the nation's first um, trans rural health clinic. And I know it, you just surpassed a thousand patients. <laughs> um, can you tell us just some of those moments of like trans joy that you all have seen there? Like, yeah, I mean, we really strive to hire trans folks and, and just ensure in general that our staff is representative of the patient population that we serve, right? And so I am in awe every day at the bravery of these kids. It's astounding. Uh, they come into Trans Health Northampton um, or just hearing their story in general and, you know, really just being able to come in and say, this is who I am. This is who I know that I am. You know, before, before kids even come into the clinic, right, before they tell their friends, before they tell their parents, they've researched everything that is possible, right? So it's, it's, it's clear this is not a whim or a fad. And instead, so many kids come in with a deep conviction and knowledge of who they are. And I think that alone, I mean, how, how many of us know kids that just deeply know who they are? How many of us knew who we were at you know seven years old, nine years old, right? That is just something to be in awe of, right? And so many kids come in with resilience, um, you know, we have a, a community closet and we have so many kids come in and they get to, you know, pick out their own clothes and swap clothes with other kids. You know, we have support groups where kids just get to sit and, you know, connect with each other and realize like, wow, I can be seen in community with other queer folks. I hear so many stories. I heard one story from our pediatrician who the kid said, she said, you know, when I grow up, she's a, a young trans girl. When I grow up, I really want to have kids someday. And her mom goes, oh, honey, you know, that's not possible. And she says, well, they told me my gender wasn't possible. And look at me now. So let's just see what happens next. And like the, the, imagine, like the, the world of possibility that so many of these kids come in with and see and visualize and and the connections that they make with other kids too, and the resilience that they bring in is just inspiring each and every day. You know, I just, I think what really motivates me are these kids, right? Their lives, their stories. And it's what, one of the many things that gets me out of bed in the morning. They're, they're brave, they're resilient, and they're really gonna be leading the future. I think you also just mentioned though, Kate, the, um, some of these trans bills. And I just wanna, just wanna put this out there that I, I really do believe that these bills are a direct attack on values that the GOP really pretend to purport, right? Liberty, freedom of speech, liberty, freedom of speech, self-determination, right? The ability to be oneself in the world. And I think when, we look at gender and expression of gender, right? We see that nothing in nature is binary. And we see that gender expression identity relates so deeply to who we are as humans, right? And these laws, they really prey on our freedom of expression, on our ability 
to speak freely, right? They prey on constitutional rights and they are fundamentally against freedom, against liberty and, and un-American too. So I view the work that we're doing at Trans Health Northampton. I view the resilience that I see from these kids. I see the world of possibility ahead as truly one of the greatest expressions of what it means to be free, to be authentic, and honestly, to live American values too. I'm wondering, I, that's very beautiful, <laughs> thank you. Um, do you think that these bills have changed the work that you all do? Like, um, I know that in some states, obviously the answer is yes, right? Um, but like, has it changed the way that you operate in your jobs day to day in terms of just care, where you're getting licensed, but also will it change trans healthcare across the country um, and slow anything down or, or just speed out outreach? Like, is the landscape changing as a result of these sort of legislative attacks? Oh yeah, it's gonna, but it's totally gonna backfire on them. It's like, I hate to break it to them, but the Generation Z and the millennials, they're not gonna put up with this crap. It's, it's the case where when they, okay, so I'm older than you guys, hang on a second. So when, when, when AIDS blew through, I was a teenager, I was a, a phlebotomist at Fenway Community Health Center. And I can't tell you how many people were like, well, this is the end of the gay agenda. This, the lesbian and gays, they'll be gone. This is going to destroy. It blasted everyone open. It blasted people out of the closet. They talked about what needed to be done. They got in the streets. They, every, every single bill or whatever that people were throwing up, they fought against. And they mobilized and they organized. And these folks that are throwing up these bathroom bills, I hate to break it to them, but it's, it's getting high schoolers to do walkouts. It's getting people to learn about things they've never learned about before. You get reading list requests from people who would never would have ever contacted you. It's like, no, these bills are totally gonna backfire because the younger generation is not gonna take this because as Dallas said, it's completely against all the things we hold dear. It's anti-freedom, it's anti-choice. And I'm sorry, you piss off the zillennials, you're gonna reap the whirlwind. These folks are going to step out and change stuff. They don't, they're not, I'm Gen X. We were like, oh, let's see what happens. But these kids are going to be like, no, this is done. This is, this, these bills are going to backfire because more kids are going to know that they're not the only kid in the world that feels that way. And once you have that feeling, no one can put that genie back in the bottle. But that's just my thought. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'm an optimist too, um, you know, uh, probably a hopeless optimist sometimes, but an optimist. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I do see, I do see the effect on our, our team. I will say when we hire gender diverse folks, right, and LGBTQ folks in general, um, it's hard to, to see this in the news every day. And I see the level of burnout that happens when we're just trying to provide health care like that's what we're trying to do and to see it turn into such a political talking point is is really frustrating and it does mean that i think especially our, our leadership team is really taking extra time to think about the appropriate ways to really care for our entire team and the people that we care for. So that's number one. And I would say anyone looking to create an organization similar or hire trans and gender diverse folks, make sure that you're also really caring for the folks, anyone that's on the margins, they're pushed to the margins really. Make sure that you are also creating appropriate structures to really make sure that people are cared for and heard and responded to and also put in positions of leadership. Um, what I would also say is that, you know, we, we looked as an organization as to ways which we might be able to respond and perhaps license in some of these states, right? And you, you just, right now you just can't, right? And we're not necessarily the ones to do that, right? We are up in Massachusetts right now. 
But what I am noticing is, you know, we're up in Massachusetts. So there is a segregation of care that is happening in more perhaps perhaps states with maybe more health infrastructure that also may uh, be a little more left-leaning politically. And then states that might be in these areas that are really having wedge issues that are being used to try to galvanize voters out of fear. And I worry about the, essentially the, the different healthcare systems that are being created in this way within a country when we really should be working towards one larger healthcare system where we all are able to receive the same type of care regardless of where we are, especially as we just exist in a more connected world. And so my hope, uh, just as Renee had said too, is that we will see a backlash and that we will see people that won't stand for this. We did see that with bathroom bills in the past. I do believe that we're going to see that again. I do believe that these are just, you know, small attempts by the GOP to try to win votes for midterms or for the next election cycle. But I don't think that you'll see these laws actually be able to stand ground. Um, I do still worry about the most, the most vulnerable. And I do worry about those places that are trying to provide this life-saving care. And I think the best thing we can do is just continue to provide this care, continue to invest in this, and then make sure that it's clear that anyone that is providing health care for anyone of any gender, that this is their lane too. It's not just a trans issue. Gender affects all of us. And to segregate or to bar care because of gender means that you know, disproportionately some people are affected and instead everyone should be galvanizing to hold the medical system and politicians really accountable. Well, th- I mean, you actually just backed into the, the, the last thing I really wanted us to touch on here, which is that Dallas, you've argued that actually trans care, gender affirming care should be the gold standard for all of us, that it actually would benefit cis people too. Can you... I, I'm wondering if you can talk about that, and Renee, if you have thoughts on this as well. Yeah, I, I, I believe, if we all think about, I would encourage everyone watching this to think about the very first experience they had that was gendered in some way, or when they first came into contact with their identity. I mean, as early on in the NICU, the neonatal ICU, right, you'll hear words like, this. she's so cute or he is so strong he's a fighter right and gender permeates our world at the very beginning and it's not till we start to really gain conscious awareness that we then begin to understand our own gender identity right and that gender identity is such a core facet of who we are as an individual that it is it is something so deep right that everyone has a connection to whether you're trans or not everyone has a connection to gender identity in some way, right? And so because of that, we all deserve as humans to be cared for in a way that is gender affirming. Now, trans and gender first people have really been leading the charge here, but there's so much that is owed to just the average American patient in terms of what gender affirming care can provide. And I think it really offers a vision for the future, honestly, right? Gender affirming care, it is comprehensive. It's not just dealing with hormones. It's not just dealing with surgeries. It's good primary care, good mental health care, good connections to community, folks in the community. Americans are dealing with an epidemic of loneliness. It is being able to not just make sure you're safe, not just make sure you're known, but make sure you're able to explore your identity in a creative manner. And how many people wish that they had a healthcare system that covered all of those bases and more and gave you a safe place to really ask the question, who am I and where do I wanna go? That is the type of healthcare that we should be striving for, for all Americans. And I believe that transgender diverse people started that and are really, showing the way. Renee, what, do you have thoughts on this? I've just been clapping. Yeah, <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, but I, I will I, I will say that you're absolutely right. It's like if the the idea of doing of treating the whole person yeah. is something that um, gender affirming care is really brought to the forefront. Because for so long we thought the whole person was you know we'll just make sure we have some behavioral health and blah, blah, blah. so the thing is that person that sits before you that patient seeing them completely and allowing them to fully see themselves is so critical in healing and quality of life and if we can help that happen for our trans patients our non-trans patients are just going to benefit from also it's like you said you know bringing the folks from the margins if we center at the margins and we treat with equity giving people who who need the most resources the resources they need you know we change the world for the better no oh, this is a dream panel i want to thank you both so much for joining me today um and sharing your expertise i could not be more grateful um and look forward to having you back in the future to talk to us about trans health thank you thank you thank you Our final conversation centers on pregnancy care. The United States ranks last among industrialized countries in rates of pregnancy-related deaths, with outcomes for women of color and those living in rural areas falling far below average. To talk about the many factors that contribute to this problem and what we as a nation can do to improve the quality of pregnancy care and childbirth are three people working closely with communities around the country. Mimi Niles is a midwife and assistant professor at the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. Abigail Echohawk is the Chief Research Officer for the Seattle Indian Health Board and Director of the Urban Indian Health Institute. Colleen DeRocher is the Executive Director for Rural OB Access and Maternal Services in Northeast New Mexico. Moderating is Nicholas St. Fleur, a reporter at Stat News and host of their new podcast on health equity, Color Code. Nick? Hey, thank you so much, Emily. Um, to start off this panel, I kind of want to speak to each of our panelists here and get a lay of the land. Um, just, I'm going to ask them to kind of give a bit of background and their views on, on the issue, the topic at hand. I'll start with, with Mimi. Could you tell us a, a bit about yourself and kind of give us this lay of the land about why this is such an important issue? Sure. Thanks for having me. So I'm Mimi Niles. I'm a practicing midwife in a very large urban practice in New York. And I'm also a research scientist looking at issues around midwifery care and maternal health and maternal health outcomes in public health care settings. Um, I think it is a very complex issue. I will say that it is, we are just at the beginning, I think, of taking a deep structural and social view of what is happening in healthcare systems. Often we have focused a lot of our attention on clinical outcomes. And so a lot of our metrics, a lot of our measurements, a lot of our investments, a lot of our fundings have gone into improving clinical outcomes for people with very a, a very limited view around the social health and the social risk factors and the mental health and the mental health risk factors that people also encounter on their pregnancy and parenting journey. And I think that is one very important topic that we need extra funding, extra thinking and extra investment around. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mimi. And then Colleen, tell us a bit about, you know, your background and, and the lay of the land as you um, have experienced it. Um, sure. I am the executive director of the Rome's Project, which is a HRSA pilot program that's uh, specifically leaning into rural um, OB care and uh, telehealth. 
And what I was surprised when I got into this as, as a manager of the program to learn that since the 1980s, um, maternal mortality in the United States is increasing, um, especially in black and brown communities. Uh, in the rural location where I am in Northeastern New Mexico, um, the data tells us that there's a 9% greater probability of severe maternal mortality when you live in a rural area. Five, where we serve five counties and three of the five are OB deserts where there is not an OB clinic and there is not a labor and delivery hospital. And in New Mexico, our maternal mortality review committee has shown us that um, 30%, almost a third of our maternal deaths in the state are pregnancy associated car accidents because our mothers are having to travel so far. In one of our counties, they have to drive five hours one way to see a high-risk provider, a tele -MF or a MFM, who wants to see them almost weekly because they have a high-risk pregnancy. So it's a 10-hour drive in mountainous rural conditions, and, and mothers just aren't able to do it. So I think rural areas in particular, it's a health equity issue, and there's a great concern about the lack of OB clinics and labor and delivery hospitals. Oh, wow. I mean, thank you so much for that. I had never heard of the, 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 the driving um, uh, portion about that. That really gives you something to, to, to think about. Um, I, I want to now toss it over to Abigail. Uh, Abigail, tell us a bit about yourself and tell us a bit about the lay of the land as you perceive it. Thank you so much. And I really um, like your framing of calling it the lay of the land. I'm an indigenous woman. I'm a citizen of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. I am a active community member here in Seattle, Washington. And as an indigenous person, I recognize the land that I am on of the Coast Salish people, my responsibility to it. As we think about the violence that has been perpetuated against indigenous peoples and those who birth, there was a focus of this colonial violence on our people who birth, not 10 years ago, 50 years ago, but more than 500 years ago. And we have seen that result in the maternal death and infant death within our communities. We are seeing that gap not close, because as was said previously, the focus has been on clinical outcomes. And while the clinical outcomes are incredibly important because our people face incredible racism and discrimination within clinical care, we have to look at the social determinants of health. And as Daniel Dawes calls it from Morehouse, he calls it the political determinants of health, the policies that have created the socioeconomic conditions that don't allow for our people who are birthing to receive transportation, access to good housing, proper food and nutrition. And we see that it directly impacting their pregnancy outcomes. And until we begin to look at those political determinants of health, until we address those social determinants of health, it won't matter how much change we make in the clinical places. It won't matter unless we are looking at the full environment in which our people birth are experiencing. For an American Indian and Alaska Native person, it is a conditions of ongoing settler colonialism, ongoing perpetuated genocide by the American uh, government, and it is our consistent fight to ensure that our people who birth are protected, whole, and that we ensure the future of our next generations. Th thank you so much, Abigail. And I want to direct my next question to, to you. Um, Whenever I, I speak to experts like yourself on this, it always seems as if to, to the experts, there's more or less a, a very clear, you know, set of, uh, of, of, of action that needs to be done to, to address these issues. Um, and a lot of the problem falls on the people in power aren't listening. Uh, Abigail, I'd love to first begin with you. What, are this, what, are the, what needs to be done to address this issue and, and who isn't listening? Yeah, so I'm the executive vice president of a federally qualified health center in Seattle, Washington, serving American Indians and Alaska Natives. In addition to that, I direct the Urban Indian Health Institute, which is a tribal epidemiology center. So I'm seeing both the clinical outcomes in our uh, primary care. And in addition to that, I'm seeing the data outcomes on a national level. And what we're finding is, for example, the CDC just released maternal death outcomes, and they did not include American Indian Alaska Native data. So when this conversation elevated to the administration's level, President Biden's, 
congressional level, what was missing, including from a front page, you know, an article that was in the New York Times, was any mention of data related to American Indian Alaska Native women because the CDC simply didn't release it. I call that data genocide. Right now, we're finding that we're not being reported in vital statistics correctly. We're being racially misclassified. The data, when it's there, is not being released. We're not using small population methodologies that can be done with this type of epidemiological data. And as a result of that, the policies, interventions, and the resources aren't being directed to the community that needs them the most. This is what structural racism looks like within these systems. And the folks aren't listening because they aren't hearing. And what they're hearing is what they call anecdotal stories because they don't have the data. My answer to them is, is the US government there is a purpose in not including our data because our treaty rights are upheld by how many tribal members we have. And if you don't report us, then you are not upholding our treaty rights because you're saying we don't even exist. And that means the allocation of resources aren't happening. We're looking at systems of structural racism that are directly resulting in the deaths of our people. And the folks who wanna listen, can't even find the right resources to do that. And when the data is there, it's often misused. I'm sure our friend here from New Mexico will remember during the COVID-19 pandemic, we actually found that a hospital in New Mexico removed babies from American Indian Alaska Native women when they were birthed because there was an assumption that they all had COVID-19. They took their babies from them at the moment of their births structural racism at its best. And so we continue to see that even when we're reported, the structural bias that exists, the structural racism is directly impacting the outcomes of our people who birth and their babies. And so folks who wanna listen need to start looking for the information. They need to start listening to the voices of the community. And those who simply don't care, we're not giving you that excuse anymore. We're going to make you care. Abigail, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can, and I, I, can I add something yes. to that too, which I, I think right is ahead, so maybe. powerful is that, I mean, the way data is used and what data is collected is a major issue in this country. I mean, there is no consistency in how data around maternal health is collected. So people may not know this, but it's collected state to state as well. And each state is doing it differently. So, so even our federal level of data is not consistent across states. So what data we collect what questions we're asking, who we're asking those questions to, and what are the questions that matter to the people that these services were built for are not being asked. So for example, measuring people's level of feeling respect in their care is not something that we are measuring, even though we know that that is very important to birthing people, particularly Black, Indigenous, immigrant, queer people. Respect and care has a very real trajectory in their clinical outcomes. And so we need to start asking people, how respected do you feel? How satisfied do you feel? Do you feel heard? Do you feel represented? Those are all things that People are not collecting. There might be local researchers that are collecting that type of da data, but until that, that type of data gets codified federally and nationally, we're not going to see any kind of movement or any kind of robust investment in truly transforming these systems. I always tell people, these systems were not made for us. They were not made for me, an immigrant woman in, in New York City. They were made for a very particular class and race of people. And so we have these systems in place that were created uh, hundreds of years ago that we're just trying to tweak and fix and, and put band-aids on and fig up, plug up the holes and then scratching our heads wondering why they are not working. And they're not only not working, they're hurting and harming and killing certain people. Mimi, thank you, thank you so much as well. And and Colleen, I'd love to kind of get your perspective from, from the rural aspect, from the rural side. What, what steps need to be taken and, and, and who isn't listening? Well, I think any of us involved in, in healthcare, and I didn't understand this until I got involved and started to look at it. Um, there's a lot of barriers to effective care, and I think we really do need universal health care. Um, we've tried to compare Medicaid reimbursement from state to state, and you can't even do that because it is so different. Um, and as both panelists already mentioned, you know, what data is collected and reported. It, it's a very fragmented system 
Um, and, and in rural America, there really just aren't the, the clinics that you need. Uh, one of the things we are leaning into that I think is a possible solution is uh, telehealth. Um, telehealth with high-risk providers but um, and telehealth with OBs. But it's difficult to make that sustainable because you already have a rural labor and delivery hospital that is losing money by providing OB services um, because the Medicaid reimbursement rate uh, can't compensate for the high costs and the large number of the population would be Medicaid. And so they're already losing money. So if they're gonna do a telehealth program with a rural health center, let's say, they can't split that global billing because it's already a loss. And so there needs to be a type of funding to allow that rural health center mm -hmm. to have their MA, to have their office, to have the equipment they need to have a, an effective tele-OB program or tele-MFM program. Um, so I think there has to be kind of systemic changes that can facilitate really effective telehealth programs. There is research that shows a lot of the patients like it um, because they don't have to leave their home. And sometimes if they're getting bad news, they would prefer to get it in their home than a doctor's office. Uh, so I think we're learning a lot about those types of solutions from the pandemic, um, but we need the structural support from broadband access uh, to ability to bill for those and, and systems that create a way uh, for those opportunities to be financially sustainable because splitting what's already a losing proposition mm. is not a way it's going to um, stand up. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, Abigail, you had mentioned, um, you know, we, you were talking about data and you were talking about anecdotes as well. As someone who has, you know, spoken to, um, you know, the, the, the husbands who have lost their wives or, or mothers who have lost their, 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 their daughters or just community people who have lost their loved ones due to this, this, this crisis. Can you speak a little to, you know, what kind of power or place anecdotes play when it comes to getting people to understand the, the, the magnitude of this, 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 this crisis of this, this, this problem? Um, Data is very important, as you as you beautifully um, um, explain. But oftentimes, anecdotes can 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 really string at someone's someone's heart. Can you tell us a bit about either the anecdotes you've heard or the the, the power of anecdotes in, in in getting people to to care about this issue? Sure, and, and I'll clarify when I say anecdotes. I see that policymakers think about them as anecdotes. I see them as data. And so when we think about data, data is both qualitative and quantitative. It is numbers and it is stories. And across the stories, you can find common themes and you can find the unique things that have happened to individuals where we need to see systems change. So these stories, stories of um, recently, just I was just a couple of years ago, um, I was working on a story actually it was for a big news outlet. We were working on a story about what Native women experience in the hardship in their second pregnancies. Um, and in the midst of that story, one of the women who was participating died. Her twin babies died. Um, and that was devastating. And I think the reporter that I was working with was so surprised by that. And unfortunately, I wasn't because I've experienced maternal death, not only within my own tribal community, but also in the work that I get to do across the nation. I've experienced infant death. In the last year, I've paid for a baby's funeral. These are the stories that happen every single day. The impact on me, I wasn't the family member. I was just part of the community. We were just part of the agency that were serving these families. The psychological impact, the mental health impact that these families experience of fathers who can't take time off because they work in low wage jobs that don't give them paid time off so they don't even get to mourn their children. Of people who birth, who experience such discrimination because they're LGBTQ plus individuals and people don't, not only are they not trying to understand them, but they treat them with incredible bias as a result of their gender identities. 
These are the stories that are data. They are important data and we have to take the numbers. We have to mesh them with that data using this mixed methodology. That is where the true story is told. We need those stories coming together with the numbers, with the anecdotes, and I'm gonna call them anecdotes as in data, so that we can bring together and show the full story of what is happening in these communities. Because it is through the stories where we see the points of intervention, where we see where hope lies, where we see where opportunity is, and where our next generations can not only be birthed in a place that is safe, healthy, and whole, but the next generations after them don't have to worry about what their parents had to experience. Thank you, thank you so much for for, for that response. Uh, Mimi, any 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 thoughts as well? I mean, some of the anecdotes or 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 some of the people who have really you know touched your heart through through your work in this area. What what what, what kind of what kind comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, I I just want to amplify what Abigail is saying too. That oftentimes in the disparities work, you hear the stories of of suffering and pain and loss, and and those are powerful and and, and impactful. And I just want to remind people that we also need to hear stories of creation and hope and joy and the bliss that happens when a new family is formed, whatever the shape and the, the makeup of that family is. I mean, I'm a midwife. I, I attend birth on a regular basis. My hands have blessed thousands of human beings coming um, onto this earth. And, and I think we also have to tell the stories back to the data point of, of where care is working for people. What are the exemplars? Um, what are this, the clinic community clinics that are run by community members where people feel deeply respected and heard because they feel representativeness in the people that are taking care of them. And so as a researcher, I am looking for those stories too, of, of telling the stories of joy, of telling the stories of, of birth that has, that has had a transformative impact on people through that birth experience. And I think that's also those stories need to be heard right now because so many, I, I would say in the communities that I work in, black women hear the stories of maternal death. And, and I unfortunately have you know, cared for people in that environment too. And they need to be affirmed and confirmed in, in their ability and their capacity to have good birth and good experiences. Um, and that, that falls on the storytellers and you know, data, people who analyze data, we are storytellers, but it also falls on community elders and community members and, and the mothers and the midwives and the, the elders and the grandmothers and the aunties in those communities to also uplift and protect those community members who are, are going into the childbearing experience. Thank you, thank you so much. And Colleen, if, if you have anything to, to add on to that, go, go right ahead. I, I do also wanna pose the question to the group of, um, you know, I'm sure there are healthcare professionals who are listening. What should they take away from, from, from this issue? What should they take away? How can they best go forward after listening to this panel and, you know, do the work to help combat this, this, this crisis? Well, I would echo what um, Abigail said about um, qualitative data and quantitative data. You know, the qualitative data, the stories, um, and the personal feedback really matters. And I think there's often a bias just to look at the numbers, uh, but hearing that feedback um, from individuals and taking into account the individual stories, I think is really important. Um, you know, we see, like I said, driving accidents here in Northern New Mexico, where a mom is driving a long distance to a labor and delivery hospital and gets in a car accident and doesn't, you know, now she's in the emergency room um, because she's had to drive such a long distance for her care. Um, we've also looked at, found moms in their third trimester walking to their um, prenatal appointments. Um, we're fortunate in that we started a new community health worker program here in Northern New Mexico, where one of our community health workers actually saw this third trimester mom walking to and from her appointment and was able to work with her to then get transportation. Um, but that took a lot of work and we needed a community health worker to help her access those services. And so I think community health workers and also having lactation consultants uh, be a billable service to Medicaid uh, are really important changes for moms. We've seen that those things work, but we need to have system changes 
so that they're somewhat sustainable instead of kind of grant to grant and pilot program to pilot program. So I would say, you know, having a lactation consultant as a clinical billable visit, not an educational visit that's reimbursed for $1.50, and having community health workers that can personally connect moms to existing resources, because it is so difficult and time consuming to navigate the bureaucracy for those things. Um, those are two improvements that we see that are funded by this program, but they need some sustainability and system changes. Thank, thank you so much, Colleen. And I'd love to extend that question to, to our other panelists as well. For the healthcare professionals who are listening in, what, what is your, your message to them on how they can be you know, a part of the solution here? Until healthcare workers begin to look at their own implicit biases that are impacting the way that they provide care, we're going to see these continue. We have to recognize that these are systems of inequity. Um, recently worked with a with an African American woman who um, professional African American woman, twenty uh, close to twenty weeks pregnant, goes into a visit, sees a new doctor. The doctor says, "Black women have a hard time handling um, type two diabetes. I suggest you terminate your pregnancy before twenty week mark." And we began to work and come to find out that doctor said that recommend it to every black woman who has type two diabetes. That person took research information instead of thinking about how it improves their care, just suggests that all black women at, you know, who have type two diabetes terminate their pregnancies. So we have to look at how people are applying information that is given to them. What kind of implicit bias lies within an individual? And we all have implicit bias. We all individually have implicit bias. Then you have to look at how the structures of inequity are playing out. Working in another hospital system, where American Indian Alaska Native women are more likely to have um, social workers or child protective services come in and interfere in, right after they have their babies in any other race or ethnic group. Um, come to find out that a lot of these Native women were afraid of the hospital staff and wouldn't show any emotion around them, then that was seen as them being disconnected to their babies and possibly putting their babies at risk. And so they were reported to social services when in fact, they were so afraid of the healthcare workers, they were afraid to show any emotion or to even talk around them. That's a systems issue. That's not a women's issue. That's not a person who births issue. So unless we look at the structural bias that exists in the systems you work in, and you need to actively address them, call them out and work to change them in partnership with community and look at yourself internally. There is not a single one of us who does not have some type of implicit bias. And we need to look introspectively every single day in a culturally humble way to understand and to work through those and to recognize when we are allowing those implicit biases to harm the way that we serve our patients. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and Mimi, I'd love to give you an opportunity as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that is a priority. And I think that the way providers are trained needs to also be transformed and needs a really critical bird's eye view sorry, a 360 view around how clinical providers are being trained. So in, in clinical training, are clinical providers being trained around core issues of reproductive justice, around core issues of birth equity, around core issues of cultural humility? For the, for the most, no, we are not being trained in that way. And so for active providers, do the work of unlearning unlearning the biases that were built into your clinical training pathway. And that means doing additional work, doing additional reading, reading books like medical apartheid and medical bondage and all the books and uh, reproduction on the reservation books that are that are critically and sociologically examining what are the power structures within healthcare systems and healthcare education that are buttressing implicit bias to remain in the system. There's no accountability system. There's no accountability metrics or mechanisms in the system to even do anything when you have a provider who is deeply biased or explicitly racist. The system is designed to protect those providers to remain in the system, especially if you're in a system where you're under-resourced, right? You're doing your best to keep providers working in that system. So I think that it really starts even before you hit the floor at the bedside, it, it becomes really critical in how we're training providers in offering care and that providers start thinking of ourselves as providers of justice as well and providers of equity as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Mimi. And now my next question, 
you know, something that kind of surprised me as I was learning more about this, 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 this American tragedy is that from my understanding, and you feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm mistaken on this, but from my understanding, the leading cause of, um, of maternal death is intimate partner violence. How do we address that? How, who, 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 how, how do we how do we best tackle it? And that's for anyone who wants to go right ahead, Abigail. Yeah, I've been working on the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls for a number of years. Um, I've co-authored both national and local reports um, that are the very first data reports of their kind. And we did find, of course, as we knew, really high rates of intimate partner violence. And American Indian Alaska Native women are more likely to experience violence than any um, other racial or ethnic group in the country. And as a result of that, we know that that impacts pregnancy outcomes. And again, for all people who birth um, and just during their pregnancies, prior to their pregnancies, having healthy bodies free of stress um, and outside things that allow your body to be healthy enough to carry a pregnancy full term and to, and to do what your body was meant to do um, during your pregnancy and afterwards. And so we do see really high rates of um, the impact of both pregnancy um, loss as a result of intimate partner violence and also of death as a direct result of intimate partner violence. And here's the thing, this is not a secret. This has been going on in this country for decades. And what we have seen is the impact pre predominantly of cisgendered white men patriarchy that has not only withheld services, but has withheld justice and has withheld uh, the ability socioeconomic ability for our people who need to get free of these environments to be able to do so. One of the things we find in intimate partner violence and people ask, why don't you leave? Why don't you leave? Financial is the number one reason. Financial and the ability to take care of their children and take care of their families. And there's also judgment applied when somebody doesn't leave. Why isn't that judgment being applied to the perpetrator? Why is it being applied to the person? And so we find not only the psychological stress, but the physical impact. One of the things we also know as a direct result of intimate partner violence, we have very high rates of traumatic brain injury. Traumatic brain injury can impact the mental health and well being of individuals because there is also um, a statistic people don't like to talk about, and that is also suicide that happens uh, during pregnancy. And suicide is and after pregnancy directly related to postpartum care, uh, postpartum depression. And also um, while there hasn't been any, you know, there's definitely researchers out there looking at what is any kind of correlation to folks who have experienced intimate partner violence and traumatic brain injury. So we have to be looking at this very holistically and recognizing intimate partner violence, um, rape culture, sexual violence within, which is also part of intimate partner violence have been ingrained in what is the Western American society. And until we begin to break down these systems that are upheld and have been upheld by white supremacy that uh, also have a gendered aspect to it, we're going to continue to see what I've been working in for decades and I'm tired of seeing. We have to begin to make the systems change and we have to begin to provide the resources and call out the inequities and where white supremacy and patriarchy are directly harming our people who birth. Mm. Abigail, thank you so much. I, I know we're at we're basically at time, but I did want to give Colleen and Mimi the opportunity if you had any other clothing, closing thoughts to share with our audience. Yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, I've been like most of us probably very reflective um, over this pandemic period. And I think what has been made blatantly clear is that we don't value the lives of caregivers. We don't value the lives of people who identify as mothers in doing this work of parenting. I mean, the, the, the exodus from the workforce has predominantly been by working mothers. And so I think all of that is indicative of what Abigail is talking about is this sort of deep white supremacist patriarchy that has made the work of parenting children of 
birthing children has minimized that work to a degree that we no longer care about what the pregnancy experiences for people, the birth experiences of people are. The, and not just that, but parenting a newborn is serious, serious work that we have not invested in. So making investments in that one year postpartum period are really critical. Universal parental paid family leave is really critical. So again, that hyper focus on the clinical moment has made everything else invisible to what is really impacting people in their ability to, to parent their children in the way that they see fit, in a way that makes sense, in a way that grows communities that are loved and beloved. And so I think we really need to just start to expand our view of what parenting work looks like and really make some deep investments in, in mothering and in mothering work and the work of women and essential workers. Thank, thank you so much, Mimi. And Colleen, any final thoughts? Well, I absolutely agree with what both Mimi and Abigail have said. Um, what I guess I would add to that is, again, a need for universal health care. Our, our rural hospitals and OB clinics working from a profit motive and having seven minute appointments with a mom who's prenatal and about to give birth or postpartum. Um, the mom's really report not being heard. I think some of the OBs might or providers might be concerned about doing a screening about partner violence or other issues because if they get, um, if they're told things that they don't then know how to deal with or don't know how to deal with in seven minutes and don't have a good referral like a community health worker or someone like that to help, sometimes it's easier to not ask those questions and not do that screening. And so again, the, the focus on the clinical rather than the person. Um, and, and I think the profit motive that makes these appointments really short and concise and clinical and not dealing with the whole person is a large part of the system change um, that needs to happen. Wonderful. Colleen, Abigail, Mimi, thank you all so much for your time. I think this was a very enlightening panel and I hope that our audience is taking away some actionable steps to, to, to help fight this, 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 this really tragic um, 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 epidemic we have in our country. Thank you. That wraps up our summit on gender and health outcomes. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our speakers and participants and to all of you for joining us today and engaging with us wherever you watch. Thank you again to our streaming partner, Stat News, and a special thanks to our sponsor, the Commonwealth Fund, for making this event possible. If you want to be among the first to hear about the 19th's upcoming events, you can sign up now for our newsletter at 19thnews.org slash subscribe. A final thanks to the thousands of members who support our nonprofit newsroom. Your donations make conversations like today's possible. If you're not a 19th member yet, we'd love to have you. You can become one at 19thnews.org slash membership. We so look forward to welcoming you to the 19th family and we will see you at our next event.